Uh, I would like again to thank the organizer for inviting me. I would actually like to It's a good buy also. <laughs> um, okay, so now today we will choose the theorem of pass. Going a bit quick on some cases, but uh, um, I laid down the strategy yesterday. So let me tell the strategy what we what we want to do. Um, you have so we have the theory TDP, which is a theory of um, if we characteristic zero and Cilian valued fields with um, an angular component map. We have two models, K, small K, <coughs> K and L, and K, L, gamma, L. And we start with two um, countable or finitely generated uh, uh, substructures, A and B. <coughs> B and B, right? With an, an L isomorphism, LDP isomorphism, which preserves preserves delta formulas. The delta formulas are those formulas in the language of pass, then of pass where we don't quantify over the field, over the value field. We can quantify over. The residue, the residue field and the value group, but we don't quantify the, the, um, the sort for the value field. Okay, and now um, we consider here a countable elementary. So this is an elementary extension of this one, and we really want to extend it here um, from A to this elementary uh, substructure of, of k, 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 and gamma k, and this is countable. Okay, so I also try to um, uh, um, see what the delta formulas are, formulas, what do they look like? So those are um, disjunction finite, Junction of um, by vex and by res of what was it x bar and uh, residue map t of x <coughs> and by group of Zeta and evaluation of um, term T prime of X. Okay, that was the, the generic form where though this one is quantifier free, and those two are any formula from the residue field of the value group. The only difference coming from this particular setting is that we have maps, we have a map. Um, V and res, right? So means that the formulas here, they can talk about, of course, they all talk about elements in K, but the, this element in K could come from the residue map. So that's what this is talking about. But the term here coming from the language of rings and similar with the evaluation. What did you write there? No, uh, here, v no, no, up, up rest, there. No, no, up there. Rest, no, no, up there. Group, the finite disjunction. Ah, okay. Finite disjunction. Um, okay, so in particular, because F is uh, a nice remark, because um, F from K A to K B um, preserves all the formulas coming from the, the residue field, all of them. 
the doors with quantifier. So this uh, means that if okay, k, k or just of the structure, if kA satisfies pi of a1 bar a n bar, this implies that kB satisfies pi of f of a1 f of a n. Okay, and here I can look inside the structure k or inside the structure, the whole structure a. Um, a, K, A, Gamma, A, um, okay. not exactly what I mean. It's not exactly what I mean. Okay, so this preserves all the formula. It means that in the big structure, K, A, K, Gamma, K, this holds implies this hold, and actually the because those are all the formulas, so in particular for the negation, it's an if and only if. L, A, L, gamma L satisfy this. And, and this is for all A1, A N bar, and K, L. So such maps are called elementary. Every map. Map preserves. All the formula it's elementary inside the structure k it's a, it's not defined everywhere it's not like an automorphism but it's more like the restriction on a, of an automorphism to a set or here to a substructure okay so we are back here and we want we have um we want to ex extend f to to this structure so the first step, well, it's step zero, but it, it's not the first trivial step. So maybe I will recall it. Step and one. So the, yes. the theory that you are taking fixes the, the residue field and value group, even if you use so the It fixes the theory of the residue field and the value group. Yes. Yeah. So we understand this. OK. So first, Sorry, I have a little confused. So this elementary, so this formula pi, he also restrict formulas only. Sorry, this is the rest. Formulas, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Only, yeah. yeah. And similarly for the for the value yeah. formulas. And this is because our theory fixes. Oh, I, I think I am. It's really because by assumption my formula f preserves all delta formulas. But if I look at delta formulas, which only talk about the residue field, then I, I'm allowed uh, any quantifier. So I'm allowed actually any formula in the residue field. So the structures A and B don't need to satisfy the theory. Right? They don't satisfy the theory. It's just a structure. But I'm talking about the truth <laughs> in my big model. I'm just saying that because it preserves all delta formulas. In particular, if I look at those formula which only talk about the residue fields, then I'm allowed. I'm, I'm just preserving all those formulas. I have no restriction of the formulas in delta that talk about the, res the residue field. Similarly for the value group. The only restriction I have is that I'm not allowed to have quantifiers on the, the value field sort. But that's the only restriction I have. Okay. So the first step is we extend uh, f a a to fraction field of a a, right? Because here the structure, the substructure. What does my language say? It says that I have a plus, I have minus a subgroup, addition, but I'm not necessarily closed by um, by inversion, we don't necessarily have all the inverses, but the inverses live, of course, in the in the superfield. So here, Ka, it's a subfield of Kk. Okay. So what do I know about f restricted to Ka? It's a ring isomorphism. So of course, 
um, F the A extends to a field isomorphism between um, track the A as a subset of KK and fraction fields of KD. This is just, I'm just saying that I can extend, well, how do I do that? I just put F of A over B to be F of A, um, presented by F of B. So I extend <laughs> to a field isomorphism. So that, that's all I'm saying right now. And what do I need to check now? That it preserves the formulas, but also that it's an isomorphism for the value field for the valuation, right? But indeed, so so first it's a field isomorphism. That is um, second. What what's happening for the valuation? Of course, the valuation of a over b is the valuation of a minus the valuation of b. Okay, so this is definition. So the, the residue. This is a field. Ah, sorry, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but okay, okay. So I want it, so now I have extended it to the fraction field of, of KA, KA, of KA, okay? Um, so indeed, the structure I get now is A, crack KA, gamma A. Okay, so indeed, the map uh, is, Still an isomorphism, right? Of the of of this valued field. I mean, of this valued ring. For for now, a is just a ring. Right. Yes. Uh, could you could you right away extend it directly to the entire k k? Um, not really. I mean, k k. Not not. I mean, there is another argument to extend it to k k. First, I want to extend it to. Okay. Uh, First, it to your elementary at the level of the residue field. There you can extend. It I know, I know, one. but but this will be the next thing. Okay. okay. Because I first want to also extend it to the fraction field of A. Okay. And for this, I need. Uh, okay. I need to extend it to the fraction field of A. Okay. So it's like just a baby case. Okay. So this map, this new map, can be the fraction fields of K B and. Gamma B, it's indeed again an LDP isomorphism. Okay, there is no there is no more um okay. so there is something to check. You want to check that this map here preserves all the L rest formulas. Okay. Because I wanted to, to preserve all the delta formulas, but here the new delta formulas I get are only talking about the fraction field of KA. Okay, so you need to check that F extend X uh, needs to check that uh, F preserves delta formulas. And for this, and it is enough to check that F preserve, um, let's say, L res formulas. Is that clear what I'm, what I'm explaining here? Because I didn't make the, the ring A grow, nor the, the gamma grow. And so how do I know that it preserves all the L res formulas? So here you have to. You have to do like a little exercise because you want to extend F is an elementary map between KA between KA and KB, and you want to prove that the, the extension to the fraction field is again an elementary map between the fraction fields. For this, you need to prove or just to check that for for all let's say L rest. Formula phi of x1 to xn, there exists 
an inverse formula by let's say star of x1 to xn or let's say y1 n z1 to zn such that for any field of only any ring or uh, integral domain uh, ring phi of a1 over b1 a n over b n holds if and only if the fraction field oh so yeah the fraction field of r is like this if and only if r satisfies by star of a1 a n b1 to bn why do I need to do that? Because I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so an isomorphism between two between two fields it preserves um, it preserves the quantifier of free form. But here I have much more. Okay, so because the fraction field somehow is uniquely determined given uh, yeah, given a given a ring an integral domain. Then I just need to say uh, that any formula will also be preserved. And, and this is just an, an induction, right? So, okay, I think it, it's clear how you, you get this. You take a polynomial equal zero. If it's a polynomial in, in, in fractions, then you just multiply by the common coefficients, and it gives you a formula in the language of rings, which only talks about the ring and not the field. Oh, look, ring to yeah, ring exactly. To the... Exactly. Okay. And so this will give you that you preserve all the LRS formulas um, because of the, because you're only growing the fields and the residue field sorts, it will also preserve all the delta formulas. Okay, so this you really this step is important. Okay, okay now um, of course here the, the the angular component map and the valuation does not. It does not change. I mean, there is nothing more to check. Now let's extend. So now we assume that K A is fraction, it's it's fraction field. Okay, it's a field. So maybe this is step zero zero, and now step zero one. You want to extend F to the fraction field of A. Okay. Now you do the same. It's even easier because here you just need to preserve the delta formulas are only quantifier free on this on this side. So to just extend f of a over b is f of a um, f of b. Okay, this is in living in L. That's how I extend it. And I need to check what? These are essentially three things. I need to check that it's an L. Fast isomorphism that it preserves delta formula. Okay, so delta formula actually here because I'm only making this grow. My new formulas we don't only talk about again quotients, but again using a little bit this trick or even here it's it's, it's more clear because it's only it's only equality or inequality of formulas. The preservation of delta formulas is okay. I think you should. I'm, I'm principally you should first check that it's in way defined, right? I mean, if a over b is equal to a prime over b prime. Right, right. No, but I mean, the, they all, all live in a, in a, well, I mean, right. Can could send a to, I mean, if <laughs> one element of the fraction field can be written as two different fractions, and you have to know that f does the right thing with the two different. Yes, four elements of the fraction. Right, right, right. Okay. No, but yes, yes, yes. Okay, but I think this is clear. I mean, just because you have you have two rings with two integral domains uh, living in another field. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, mean, I don't think there is. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, two rings, two integral domains living in a field. Uh, it's yeah. definable. It's, it's a definable closure. So there is no choice. 
Okay, so it's not, it's not like abstraction, uh, abstraction, yeah. abstraction feed here. Yeah, no, I, okay, I was, I was thinking to go right. back. So this is not the abstract construction, it's the sub ring, the sub field of K, which consists of all the fractions. Yeah, it's just yeah. uniquely defined. Yes, there is no ambiguity. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm not doing an abstract construction. Okay, and, and so. Now, what is your remark in delta formula? Yeah, so 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 again, now the formulas that I'm looking at that looking at well, that I want to check are those, and wait, sorry, here it's not rest, it's AC. Okay, and oh, um, all the formulas has X involved. Yes, 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 exactly. So so exactly. So indeed, we need to to check something. So first, um, right. So first, we need to check that it's a substructure. Okay, that. Uh, with the fraction field, it's still the substructure in the sense of element. So first, is it closed under AC? So why is it closed under AC, under the angular component? Because AC of A over B is AC of A over AC of B. This is in K. Okay. But I already extended. I know that my field, uh, my residue field is a field. So this indeed lives in KA. Okay, so it's a substructure, it's closed under AC, and I need to check that V of A over B um, is also in my substructure, which is clear again. Ah, okay, so why, why, why is it clear? Why do I know that this lives in gamma A? So my AC group. Yes, exactly. So it, it's important here that my group, my, my gamma has the minus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as a substructure, this is already a group. Those are, are rings, but this is a group. Okay. So, um, yeah. So if I extend F like this, I indeed still have that the, the structure frac of A, K A, gamma A. This is still a substructure, LDP substructure, and it's an isomorphism. Um, okay, it's, it's also an isomorphism of LDP. Yeah, but okay, now I'm assuming that K okay, is, is the. Okay, so what else do I need to check now? Okay, now we look at delta formulas. So what about this? Indeed, I have enlarged this the the the, res, the value in field, but this already lives in K A. By just because just by what I wrote here. Okay. Those already live in K A, and those, for the same reason, already live in my in my value group. So if my so. I just need to check that those formulas are preserved. Okay, let's do it again. Um, I want to, I, I'm given A, K, A, gamma, A. K, A is already a, a, an um, a field. Gamma, A is a group. And I want to extend the, the function F to the fraction field of A. So I'm defining F of A over B, because F of A, um, Presented by f of b. This gives me a map from frac, frac of a, from this structure to uh, b, a, b, gamma b. I mean, okay, and then just check that. Uh, I mean, it's an isomorphism between a and b. So of course, it's on to the fraction field for every two element in the fraction field of b. Uh, just taking the pre-image. Uh, under F, so it's it's a, a, an isomorphism, um, and now this structure. Okay, so it's an isomorphism of fields. I need to check that this is again an L pass substructure and that F commutes with the operations. Why is it closed under my two maps AC and V? So okay, it's a field, so it's closed under the operation. And now, if I take the AC, I all get, uh, you can fall into the, the fraction field of KA, which is already KA. And similarly, the valuation lives in the group generated. Okay, 
And so now, if I look at my delta formulas, I have a new delta formula talking about um, the code element in B structure. Then here, I might have quotients, A1, etc. And here, I'm only having elements which already are preserved by, by my, form, by my um, isomorphism F. Why? Because, OK, so this variable on the range of a Ka, and this one, I take a term in the fraction field, and I'm applying AC. And so I'm, I'm not getting anything else than the AC of something in the fraction field. And uh, anyone because of this, RDF is quantifier free, no? Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah. Okay, so so those two don't really matter because I already know that I preserve those, and this is preserved because it's a field isomorphism. Preserve quantifiers in formulas. Okay, so we get the substructure. It's um, it preserves data formula, and it's an and it's an it's an um, isomorphism for those things. Okay, I'm hiding. Okay, I'm not checking that f of v of f of a. Okay, but there, this is almost by definition but just just commutes. Sorry, I'm confused. Why, why do you write uh, k a is equal to frac? Yeah. So now I assume that it's it's uh, I mean it's a field. Okay, frac. It's it's equal equal to its own fraction field. It's a field. Because we already extended just before with the fraction field. Okay. And why is this important? Because of this. Because then I know that the angular component map does go to to, to quotient and to Ka. Okay. Okay, so I will keep this here and maybe I will I will do the next step. Um Okay, so what's the next step? We need to extend. So now we can assume we can assume that um, A and K A are fields. So now we do what uh, Amy was suggesting, which is we use the fact that, that this map F is um, an elementary map, it means that I, I will be able to extend it um, to many elements because it, let me do it. So we extend, we extend F um, to KE. Okay, so now I will be able to extend it to the whole, the whole residual field of my subject. Okay, <laughs> just I'm extending the isomorphism from Ka to K. So why, how can I do that? So this is very standard. Um, it's very standard in modern theory, and it's, ex it's essentially exactly applying that this, this holds, that if the formula F preserves all the formulas, um, we'll be able to find the weakness. OK, so I let, um, for instance, AI be an enumeration of Ke minus Ke. Okay, I take an enumeration. So Ke, so what this was countable structure. Okay, so I can just take an, an enumeration. 
accountable enumeration of rates. Okay, so we start. So I will I will start by extending f to a zero, a zero bar, then to a one bar, then to a one. So um, let sigma uh, x be the set of LRS formula such that um, formula, let's say, phi, phi of uh, bar, the formula with parameters in uh, what? In KB8. Uh, such that a game satisfies uh, of a zero bar. Okay, now I'm taking all those. This is important. It's the mm -hmm. LRS. All those elements formulas, which are satisfied by a zero in my suit. Yeah. Um, what do I know? Um, let sigma. Let's say so. So those formulas are, are parameters in K A. So I can apply F to my parameters. It's sigma f. It's the set of phi f of x for phi f in uh, sigma. And by definition, if f phi of x c1 tn uh, is defined like this, or so if I have a formula in x with c1 cn as parameters, my phi f of x is by definition the formula phi of x uh, f of c1 f of cn. Why do I do that? Those are all the formulas satisfied by my two, by my uh, element a zero. Okay, so. Those those formula here, they I, I want that if a zero satisfies it, right? Then the image also satisfies this formula. Modulo applying f to the to the coefficients. So what I want to do, I want to um, find a v zero bar in L such that. Um, L in KL, okay, just that um, KL, gamma L satisfies the whole sigma of B0, by which I mean that B0 satisfies all those formulas. Why do I want to do that? Because then if I have a B0 like this, if K, 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 gamma K satisfies the rest of A0 with parameter C1 again, then L, K, L, gamma L satisfies the rest of B0, um, F of C1, f of cn just by definition okay i take the the set of all formulas satisfied by a0 in ka or in in, in ke and i take the image okay this is really by definition take the time to read and here i'm i'm using something very important 
in a sense, I'm using that if I want to preserve, if I want to look at any formula that talks about this A0 okay, in my structure A, K, A, gamma, A, I have this A0 bar, which is here somewhere outside. And I'm looking at the formulas that are satisfied by A0 and something like something in here, some parameters in here. But now, because of this, this formula can only, the, the only meaningful thing that will happen is in here, right? Because this cannot talk about this, this element, which is not in the value group sort. And this cannot talk about this new element A0, which is in, because here it's in the, the value tree sort. So the only formula that I need to consider is this one. What about this, this twiddle here? What, what about this, this thing? Well, we know that it's a substructure. So this already leaves whatever the value we need here because I'm not looking at new element in A. So whatever the value from A that I plug in, it will be an element from KA. So really, when I look at the delta formula satisfied by A0 over this, I'm actually looking at the formula that talks about A0 over this. So I only need to look at those formulas, the ARES VOP formulas with parameters in KA, which are satisfied by. In a sense, it's a, it's a separation of, of um, sorts. And where does, that, the, where does that come from? It really comes from the fact that there are no map going from the residue field anywhere else. So something which is satisfied. Uh, so what the residue field has to say, what the whole structure has to say about A0, it's the same as what the residue field has to say about A0. Yes, yes. Uh, that A0 bar is for every A0 bar in uh, KA or... Okay, for no, not in KA, outside of KA, and I want to extend it to KE. Okay, so, so which... So I have an enumeration, I start with A0. Yeah. So now let's just consider A0 and I want to extend my map to A0 bar, sorry, A0 bar. I want to extend my map to A0 bar. So what I will have to do is that I will have to prove that if a delta formula in here is true for this A0, and it's also true in here for the image of A0. What I'm saying is that the what does the delta formula with parameters in this structure can tell me about A0? What do I do? I look at this sort of formulas here. Let's say I have any parameters in A, KA, gamma A plugged in here, and it talks about A0, A0 bar. So A0 bar appear in this formula. Okay, A0 bar is an element from the sort KA. Now, what's happening? So this element is in A. Okay. Those elements here, they live in KA. But this, but this formula uh, doesn't talk about the element A0 bar. This element here, they leave. Okay, so here I have a, a tuple of variables. I could have some element from Ka and some element coming from Ac of a term in, of an element in A. But all of this, this lives in Ka, and the other element lives in Ka. So it's really here I have a formula with parameters in Ka, which says something about A0. And here I have an element from gamma K, uh, gamma A. And here again, elements from gamma k because I'm applying the variation to some term in A. And this is a substructure, so the variation goes to gamma a. Yes. So for this argument you gave, it's important that in the formula fibrous, you cannot quantify over x, no? Over the variable in, like, no, no. In so you, you said, okay, we don't have to worry about that. We only worry about this part. Yes. And this part is fine because we do not quantify about over the variable coming from the. Yes. Value. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here, here does not quantify over X. Only, it only quantify over, yes, exactly. It's a good point. Over, over the, the residue field. Okay. 
Okay, so is it clear that this is what I want to do? More or less, or? So, so, because what is in the point is that you can substitute any occurrence by AC by the actual value of AC. Yeah, exactly. That, that's yeah. one of the main points is really that um, here I'm going with a substructure. So I already know that, that the image of A, that those terms are, they are equal to element of KA in a sense. So you can just, yeah. Uh, it's clear. You can just you could just replace this by the formula saying uh, alpha equals this one, in a sense. But you already know that this lives in K. So okay. And then if you prove so, you are joining that this zero extent, and you know that preservation of formulas will occur. Exactly. By definition, you can preserve the formula. So how do I find such a B zero? I don't know. How do I find the such a zero? I need to prove that this set is this set of formula is consistent in my structure L. I need to check. I need to check that there is a B0 in KL that satisfies all those formula at the same time. Okay, so we use the only theorem that we have in model theory, which is compactness. Okay, so by compactness, it is enough. Check that um, sigma f of x is finitely. Consistent, which means if I take um, finitely many formulas in my set sigma f, then I can find a, a common realization of all those finite formulas. So I, I could just take also the conjunction of a finite formula from sigma of finitely many formulas in sigma, and, and I need to find the realization in L, A, L, gamma L. So those are variables from, from the residue field. And sometimes I just open, oh, I, I forget to put them the bar. Okay, so let's sigma f zero in the finite subset of sigma f of x. And let's, for instance, psi of x be the conjunction of the formulas in sigma zero of f. Note that actually this conjunction is already an element from sigma f. Right? Why? It's already a conjunction because it's all those formulas, by definition of sigma, all those formulas are satisfied by a single element a. Where is it? Where is it? A formula such that this satisfies phi of a zero. Okay, so if I take just finitely many of those, okay, uh, it's satisfied by, by this finitely many, so it also satisfies the conjunction. The formula consisting of the conjunction, but okay. okay, this is in sigma. Okay, um, how do I know that this has a, a solution in N? So here the point would be to use that this uh, map is elementary. So it's it's really uh, it's a very general argument. You have an elementary map, okay? So because we know we know that if I take okay, so I can just write it f, okay? Because I'm already considering that those the parameters are the images of element from Ka, so I write phi f, and we know that, um, what is it, k, kk 
Yana k satisfies psi of a zero. Is it clear this one? Here I'm, I don't have the f, okay, the sort of the, the formula without saying f to the to the parameters. Okay, so by definition sigma is the second row formula satisfied by phi of a zero. I just take the image of the parameters, but by definition, this formula phi, which is also an element of sigma f, it comes from phi f comes from sigma f. So there is the phi which comes from sigma, and by definition, it satisfies by a zero. So, so you, you provide... yes, k k. Not... So you don't need the three things. So this is this is a formula in L rest. No? This is a formula in L rest. I mean, I'm already. Because I had this discussion before, I'm already taking the all of those formulas in NRS. So what I mean, you don't need to write the triple. You could say KK satisfies psi of a zero. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't give me how do I get this B0. How do I know that now I can find the solution of this one? So here it's just because we know that this holds, right? In in K, K, gamma K, because we know it has A0 as a witness. Right. Okay. okay. Just, I have a witness, so indeed it satisfies this. But then this is a formula. Maybe I can make the, the parameters precise, right? So those are F of C1 f of cm, okay, phi of x bar, f of c1, f of cm. And so this formula is really uh, c1, f to cm. And now because my map is elementary, now this is any formula from LRS. And here, I know that my map preserves any formula in LRS, even those who have quantifiers. So here it's crucial that my map is elementary so that I can find which map is elementary. F, F restricted to the residue field. Because those formulas which are preserved are allowed to have quantifiers. Okay. So because the map is elementary, gamma L also satisfies this. X C one to uh sorry F of C one F of C N because as F restricted to K A is in a sense L rest element I mean it just preserves all the formula of L rest because all the formulas of L rest are delta form. Okay, so let me let me uh, try to re-explain. So because of this separation of thoughts, we look at the formulas that are satisfied by A0, the delta formula satisfied by A0 with parameters in this whole structure. It's enough to look at those and rest formulas with parameters in only the residue field that are satisfied by A0. Now I want to I want my map to preserve to preserve all those formulas. So if I define my set of formulas to be exactly all those endless formulas that are satisfied, I just have to find the weakness of this other set of formula where I apply f to the coefficient. Okay, because of this, if I find the v zero which satisfies all of those, then by definition for all furious formula. If this holds, then this holds. And, and so I just have to extend my map F to some F of A0, where F of A0 equals B0. How do I know that there is a B0? So this uh, theorem, compactness, tells me that if I consider this as an abstract, as just a set of formula, 
if I can find weakness for every finite subset, then I will use compactness and actually saturation to find a weakness for the whole set sigma L. How do I know that it's finitely satisfiable? I take finitely many formulas. I take the conjunction of those. By definition, by choice of what this formula is, um, k, 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 gamma, k, so, I mean, a0 bar satisfies phi in this structure. This is by choice of my set sigma. Now, it means that the formula that where I quantify over the x bar, there exists x phi of x c1 to cn, um, which is now a formula only in parameters from, from ka. Okay, if I quantify, I forget about the a0. And so my formula here, there exists x, blah, 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 is only talking about fx. So I can apply, so first I can apply f restricted to ka. And secondly, because it's elementary, it's also preserved this whole formula. So I'm reviewing the notion of elementary. So I thought that quantifier had to, so the map that is elementary is from ka to kb. So I thought the quantifier should refer to elements in ka. I, I don't understand why. And refer to, uh, to, but to this KB. refers to element in Ka. It's a there exists x bar, a, a bar is in Ka. I mean, it's in Ka. E, 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 okay. but, the, but the map of this elementary is from Ka to Kb. No, but yes, but elementary means that the, the truth of the structure is considered, the truth of the formula is considered in the whole, in the big structure. That's what it means to, to, to uh, preserve delta formulas. Because anyway, this is not a model of my theory. This is just a substructure. So if I want to look at the truth of a formula um, with um, talking about this, I'm still referring to the truth in this big structure. In, in, the, in the star of yesterday, the truth of the value, when I say that it preserves delta formula, I'm really looking at the truth of the Formula. I want the formula to make sense in my theory, not in a substructure where I don't have the control on the theory. Okay, maybe just by if I want to state it without talking about elementary map, I have an isomorphism which preserves delta formula. What does that mean? If I have a formula in delta which is satisfied by A, then this formula is also satisfied. So if this is satisfied in K, by A, it's also satisfied in L by F of A. And that's all I'm saying here, because now, because I'm looking at formulas for an element in the residue field, I only need to look at those formulas in a ring. And um, yeah, and, and then because I'm preserving, all, in particular, all the formulas in the residue field, um, this formula, which is now satisfied by elements, those are elements of A A. And my map, my map is not defined on A zero bar, but it is defined on this. And this formula is witnessing that locally, the set of formula has a witness because, because F preserve, forget about elementary, F preserve delta formula, this is a delta formula. This is a delta formula plugged with an element in Ka. So if I apply F to this coefficient, I still have the truth of this formula, which means that there exists, by definition of what it, this means, it means that there exists a, I don't know, C, in KB, no, not in KB, not in KB, in KL, such that uh, L, KL, gamma L um, satisfies phi of C, F of C1, or we can, we can just call it D, if it's not ambiguous, F of D, F of C1, F of Cn. What does this show? 
it shows that this set is finitely satisfiable because I took an arbitrary Ips. One conclusion from this finite satisfiability. Um, here in the notes, it says that it's not by compactness, but by Aleph 1 saturation. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so so now I've shown, yeah, it's 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 the same thing. So now I've shown that this set is finitely satisfiable, and I, by assumption, my structures here are Aleph, I mean, just this one, actually. Aleph 1 saturated. Aleph 1 saturated, what does it mean? Mean that if I have a, an infinite or oh, a set of formulas which is not too big, so of cardinality countable, if it's finitely consistent or finitely satisfiable, then there is a witness living in my structure. Yeah, it, it's it, really what I mean by compactness is really by a different saturation. So we need to check what one thing. Now that we know that it's finitely satisfiable, we need to check that this is comfortable. And this is where we use. Um, okay. So why is it countable? Let's say A is countable. Yeah. I mean, KD, which is the image of KA, is countable by uh, injection. This is countable, and I have a language with, which has only finitely many symbols. We have two copies of the language of rings and a copy of the language of field and two maps. Oh, so I can be the. Um, right. Can I erase this? Is it more clear what's happening or? It's not necessary, but do you want to make the intermediate break? So maybe today we want to go in a row with this one. It is possible to go in a row. Okay. If, if that's okay, we can go in a row because it's okay, uh, fine. Is someone a, some complain? No complaint. No complaint. This step, for instance, is uh, for Amy, it was it was obvious that we could do that. Yeah, it was so <laughs> obvious that I didn't notice that it's more difficult than the quotient. Yeah. <laughs> because because uh, this is a very, very standard argument in, in model theory. But this is when we are getting trained. Exactly. Standard and exactly. Exactly. OK. So how do we conclude? We know that sigma f of x is finitely satisfiable in L, K, L, gamma L. And um, and the cardinality of this set of formula, uh, let's say it's bounded by by countable, prob yeah. it's probably countable in any way because you have you are the ring of fact is zero, so it's okay. So by Aleph one saturation of L a L gamma L, there exists a B zero such that um yeah okay so you so you 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 see that we we do extend this this notion of satisfiability gamma L for the whole set okay sigma F of B zero which means I A um L um L L by for all by in sigma L. Okay, this is what I mean by this. This is called the uh, a type in what it says, which is a consistent set of performance. And now exactly because this is what hap what's happening by definition okay. means that this the map that I define from sending a zero to b zero 
okay, preserves all the formulas um, from delta, which in this case, it's enough to look at the formulas from the residual uh, language. And then because of the first step zero, you can also extend it. Um, okay, actually you don't need the, the step zero. Okay, so, so first we, we can extend it to a map which satisfies this. Okay, it's not a substructure, it's nothing. It's just a map that preserves, if it's true for A0 and something, it's true for B0 and something. Now, what can I do? I started, not here anymore, I started with the numeration of A0, A1. Okay, this is an enumeration of uh, enumeration of k k minus k uh, sorry k e minus k a yes. now what do I do I look at a1 bar and then I define for a1 bar the same set here but where I, I allow this new parameter a0 bar I do the exact same thing. I find the weakness B1 such that I will have this not only for A0, but also for B0 bar. Uh, I mean, for A0, A1 bar and B0, B1 bar. Um, yes. Why? Why can I do that? What's the only thing that I have to check is that so the 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 finitely satisfiable argument will also hold, right? So maybe here I have a zero bar, but because this holds, or this new map that goes from a zero to b zero, then I will also have uh, the finitely satisfiability. So this is okay, and and the set, so the argument here, this new set that I will get by adding just one parameter, will be also countable. But now I do it for a two bar, a three bar, etc., and for a zero bar up to a n bar. Okay, and again, every time once I'm here, I'm looking at parameters from k a union finitely many elements. It will stay countable. Uh, this map now, I mean, the the formula that you will get is a zero. A n minus one implies this, um, and slowly and slowly you are defining um, uh, a, a set of image B zero bar B n bar such that the formula um, are preserved. Then I, I and I and I just do it. Uh, and yeah, and so again, this has parameters from K A union of finite sets. At every step, it's a finite set. So I'm not increasing the cardinality of this set, and I can still um, apply an F1 saturation. Okay, and so by this by this iteration, I get indeed a function. Uh, now, now the function I have. Once I've enumerated, enumerated the whole KE, and it's an easy, I mean, it's an easy exercise that because you have a name entry map that goes from this enumeration to this other enumeration, all the relations of the field, the, the I don't know, A0 plus uh, AI equals B17, uh, this will, of course, because at each step, I'm conserving the same, the same formula. This will, of course, send the field. It will preserve the whole script. So you can turn, you can, you can extend to its image and, and fill it, fill in the, the whole K, the whole K. Yeah. And there is a very important thing that I'm using here. The K E is now uh, was countable. Okay, mm -hmm. here I could not do that if it were not countable. So we we used the Wenham's column to get a countable intermediate thing 
and then we will. So now we have extended to the whole thing. I think you say to make it comfortable, maybe you need to use twice the going down and going up theorem. Like, what? Do you? Uh, don't wait because because <laughs> we, because we, when when we use the app that we have Syrian, maybe I don't we don't know the result. Maybe it's not countable. Maybe it's countable, and then if it's not countable, we 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 could make it come. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I think you can track. Yeah. I didn't need the app. You need to use the one. Yeah. So that works. <laughs> okay. Ah, from K. Okay. Okay. That that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So now, so this was step. Uh, was it step? I was step one. Step one. Yes. Okay. So what else do we want to do? So what was the essential argument that we that we used here? The essential argument that f from K to K B is an elementary map. Elementary in the sense that if a formula in my structure is true for this uh, tuple of elements from the domain of my map, then the truth is preserved through the, the evaluation in, now in the L, L, K, L, K map. But this also holds for another map. Okay, so step two, um, no, step one was the extent. We may assume that Ka equals Ke. Um, so, what is the other map that also has this sort of property? Where does this property come from? It comes from the fact that my map F, which consists of Fa, Fka, F gamma A, preserves all delta formulas. But if I look at the delta formula that talks about the residue field, it's all my formulas. Particular for this existential formula that I had here, I could preserve it and the whole argument works. But it's also the, the same here. I also have a load quantifiers on the on the value group. So for the map, the map F gamma A from gamma A to gamma B is is elementary. Really, in the sense that it preserves um, all L group formulas. Okay, let me write this maybe a last time so, so that we are all we all agree on what this means. So it's in if K A K, 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 gamma K satisfies phi. Now it's a phi group of uh, what was it? Gamma one, gamma n. Then L, K, L, gamma L satisfies phi group of F of gamma one, sorry, F of gamma n. And where are the gamma coming from? Gamma one to gamma n are in gamma a, the domain of my, my map. Okay. All right. Okay, so again, I will if I do the exact same argument, the exact same quantific quantification here, but I replace L rest formulas by group formulas, then I can do the, I can extend to the enumeration of the complement of gamma K, uh, gamma E um, in gamma A. And I take an enumeration and things are comfortable and adding finitely many parameters, so it's incountable. So we may also assume that gamma A is gamma. Um, 
Okay, that's step one. Let's do step two. Okay, so what do I have now? I have, okay, maybe before step two, I I will say, say something which is very nice. Okay, so every remark. Okay, now, now, no, not, no. now we assume that the structure we consider is actually A, gamma E, okay, that's okay, E, and gamma E. And the map F goes to B, and I will not give them a name. I didn't give a name of the image of, of uh, yeah. yeah, F of KE, F of your right. This map, what does it do? It's, this is a delta structure, so it preserves the, the, um, the, the language of pass uh, structure and it preserves all delta formulas. Now, important remark, assume that we have, we have extended F to a uh, um, structure, let's say A containing C, an intermediate structure between E and C, I mean, a field C such that uh, this gamma, uh, KE uh, gamma E is a substructure of E to E gamma E, then it will not be, then, then it preserves delta formulas. I think that should be clear right now because of this. And because now we know that as soon as I make the field grow, the image, the valuation, the, the, the angular component of any element of the field is already in my group because it's gamma E, and I'm taking an intermediate structure between A and E, field between A and E. And also the, the valuation is in my gamma E. Okay. And the map, by definition, here, it's, it preserves delta formula. So everything about the value group and the residue field, if I can extend it to an delta isomorphism, then it all automatically preserves delta formula. OK. Now we can do step four. <laughs> Uh, step no, not step four, step two. Step two. So what is step two? Now we want to assume that okay, what is this thing? This is we have a valuation on A, right? So it's a valued field. The, the valuation on A goes in gamma E, of course. You don't know whether there are elements in gamma E that are not the valuation of elements of A. Okay, it's just a substructure. Maybe the gamma E is very big. We, we don't know that the map here is, is on two. I mean, that's step three. I don't know if you want to do the other one first. What was step two? The step two was the residue you know, in something subjected to the residue. Ah, um, what? So it's the step two is just making the. Ah, right, right, right. No, but that is, that, that's, that's the one. Yes. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Just, just, just to make sure. So we are saying now we just need to extend F to an alpha isomorphism. Yes. So but, but, and essentially, I mean, so we need isomorphism, but we do not need to consider any formulas anymore. So I mean, in sense, we are not needing, we don't need any model theory anymore, right? Nonsense. There will, break, there will be some, some model theory arguments still. Yes. Um, but uh, in a sense, because we have we have filled up the value group, the value group and the residue fields, we don't um, yeah we we don't need to do this sort of um, argument. But it's it would still be it will still be uh, there will still be some argument of of, of 
But indeed, now we, now we will start using our uh, small theorems about initialization, about about valuation. Let's okay, so let's let me state what I want to do now. Okay, so we know that the value group, the valuation again is not onto. Of course, the angular component map is not necessarily onto either. But still, I have a valuation, so I do have a residue map, and the residue map does go into K A K E. And I want to make this residue map um, subject. I mean, oh, no, what I want to do now, um, yeah, we want to make it subjective. We uh, extend F to a field C such that the res of C is exactly K. Yeah. Um, okay, if, if you consider in the in the in the valuation ring AV in the valuation in the valid field AV, you have this map. I mean, it's also definable from the angular component, etc. But you have the map that goes from let's say O A to K. I think I wrote it K tilde A. A, which is a subfield of K. And then we want to take, of course, the, the map is defined for element in KE, right? That we want to do is that we want to take element from KE, find pre image, and try to, to extend um, our map. So let's uh, A bar be in KE minus KA theta. Um, Right. Okay. And we want to extend F such that uh, F okay to a field such that we, we can reach A. Okay, A is, is a is an image of, of a, an element of the field uh, of the field. Okay, so now there are two cases. One is that uh, A is algebraic over a, a tilde, and the other one is transcendental. So I think I wanted to do the algebraic case. Uh, okay, maybe I have time to do the algebraic case. So essentially, in in those two in those two. Two steps at a time. Okay, maybe I will do transcendental case so we can move to uh, to the other. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, why there is the two on the K A in the relation? Because because you, you because you because you don't know. It's a value. It's a valuation. Uh, okay, the image of rest. Uh, is contained in in the in the image of AT, yeah. right? Yeah. And AT is not even subjective, it's not the image. right? Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, did I? Okay, I did not define. Sorry. Res of O A, I write it A A T down. Okay, no, yes, this is the definition. Yeah. It's the image. Okay, let's let's just ask him that maybe. Um, <laughs> I think I want to do this. Because it really uses some. Okay. A is algebraic of A A theta. Okay, so let P be the minimal. Maybe I can write it P bar, minimal polynomial of A bar over A A tilde. Uh, Minimal polynomial monic, physics monic, and let P in OA of X be a leaf of K where we 
maybe a, a, a list of p bar, which is monad. Okay, I'm, I'm choosing one as a pre image of the leading coefficient, which is already one. Okay, then. Um, right, then, of course, uh, P. P is irreducible. Okay. Um, so we get, uh, because when characteristic zero, we do get that P of A bar equals zero and P bar prime of A bar is different from the, okay. taking the, the, irreducible polynomial uh, and we are in characteristic zero so there is no there is no um, the root of material. okay so by Ansel's lemma in the um, Anselian Valued field E. How do I know that E is an Selian? It's elementary. Exactly. It's an elementary substructure of my model of TDP, and TDP says that it's an Selian. Okay, by Hansen's lemma in the Hansen valued field, there exists um, B. A root of P of X such that uh, residue of B is a bar. All right. Now, two things maybe. Okay, maybe one thing first. P of X is also irreducible. Um, over A, because if it were reducible over A, I would just apply the residual map and I would get, because it's monic, I would get two, I would get a, um, a reduction on the residue field, but it is irreducible in the residue field. Okay, it's irreducible over A. Um, Okay, this is with this level of A, and now uh, look at F of P in the sense that I apply F P is in, is in A of A, I can just apply F, and I look what's happening on this. Uh, so it is irreducible over B. And because this map F, F is a valued field isomorphism between A and B, I can just uh, apply okay, P bar to F of A, and I get the same thing, but on the other side. Okay. Don't forget that A bar lives in Ke, and my map is, is defined on Ke. So here, in a sense, I'm really using the elimination of the quantifier that I mentioned in the example yesterday. The, the existence of some roots is actually equivalent to a formula which only talks about the residue. Okay, so this is equal to zero, and res of P prime of um, okay, no, it's rest of f of p. So first I apply f to my coefficient, and then I look at the result. So f of p prime is different from zero, and so by Ansel's lemma in 
uh, in L, A L, gamma L, I get rules. There exists. Okay, maybe I could I could call this one A. There is the A. A root of P of X such that res of A. Yeah, it's not good. Okay. There exists a B in L such that um f of p in b equals zero and and what's important the residue of b is f of uh, a bar yeah which is f of a bar so, uh, this is in f of evaluated at the element f of a bar if Zero and, I, and I, here it's, it's the easy case in the equal characteristic zero, the easy case of n sets zero. Okay, so I have a field isomorphism from A to B, and, and A is the root of the polynomial P, which is a reducible over A, and B is the root of the polynomial F of P, which is a reducible over B. So F extends to a field. Isomorphism. Field. For now, we only know field. That's the field isomorphism. Now we, we need to check two things. We need to check that F commutes, um, F is a, is a valuation, preserves the valuation first. And we need to check that. Um, Yes, and we need to check that it commutes with the angular component. Okay, that is, so this is the condition for being an LDP NF plus isomorphism. So first, let's look at what's the valuation on this field. Okay, we so we all agree that this leaves inside. A bigger value field, so of course it already comes with evaluation. We, and now we need to somehow ensure that the isomorphism that we define here makes the valuation coincide. So now I stated a, um, a statement the other day. Let me remind it. So it was uh, corollary something. It was the first case. Yeah, that was the, the um, let me just write it. One res of A res of A n minus one are uh, A linearly independent. Okay, linearly independent over Ka. This implies that the valuation of sigma of ti a to ti is equal to uh, the minimum, yes, of the valuation of the ci. Okay. Remember this? That was the, the argument was a bit more general. We had a family where the valuation were different sets and the family where the residue field were linearly independent over the, the subfield. And then we could explicitly give what the what's the valuation. All right. Okay, so this is what's happening. So of course, those are linearly independent, right? So n, n is the degree of my minimal polynomial. Every element in, in A of A is written as a linear combination 
of powers of pi of a. Okay, so I know that in it implies that in a of a, every element which is of the form sigma of ci i i equal zero to uh, n minus one, let's say n is the degree degree of uh, p in a of a every element satisfies v of sigma of c i a to the i is the minimum of the v of the c i okay so what what's happening to v of a i why why doesn't doesn't it talk about v of a i because the the a i they um they are all of valuation zero because the residue are all non zero. Okay, so I have this. So in particular, I know one thing. This gives me a, a lot of information. In particular, it gives me that V of A A star, where does it live? In, in KE, it's only given by element from V of CI, uh, from, uh, from valuation of element of A. Okay, so it's, it's included in gamma of A, which is actually yeah, gamma of E. But the point is that this is um, an extension which, so AA or, over A is an extension which doesn't make the, the valuation group grow. Okay. This we will use, in particular this. But what about what about the commutation? Now let's check that indeed this f here is a valid field isomorphism. But I think it's now we should be clear for the case. Right? Okay. So now I look at um, f of the valuation of sigma of AI, uh, of CI AI, right? Okay, so what is this? This is F of the minimum I of the V of CI. It only depends on the coefficient. But now F, where does this leave? What is this? Where does it leave? In gamma e, right? And what is f restricted to, ga to gamma e? It's an isomorphism of ordered groups. So this leaves uh, this leaves in gamma e. It is gamma a. Okay, right. Okay, now I will just look at e. Okay, but f is already f restricted to gamma e because I extended it, right, is an order preserving map. Right? It's an isomorphism of, of value group. Of, uh, of order, order that I use. Okay, so means that this is the minimum of the F of the V of CI. Okay, now what is this? Where does this lead? F of C, V of CI. Again, it lives in gamma E, but what do I, it lives in, actually in the image of A under the valuation. And F is already the valuation preserving map from A and B. So here we know it's it commutes. It's V of F of CI. And then why is this equal to what we want? We just apply this corollary in B. Okay. And this is um, uh, the, the minim minimum. This is the valuation. So F of CI are the coefficient. And this is V of sigma of F of CI 
B to the I, right? Because in, why is this true? In the extension B, B of B, what I wrote here is, is also true. I'm applying the corollary. It's also true on the B side. Okay, so, so res one comma res of B, res of B n minus one, uh, KB linearly independent or KB tilde linearly independent. Right. Okay, that's that's how I choose my my B. B actually, yeah. It's even here it really follows because the residue of B is actually the F of A bar. Okay, so by the corollary. Okay. Okay, and this is indeed F of sigma of A I uh, of C I. A to the I. Okay, so it commutes with the valuation. So this this map, which were at first just a field isomorphism, it's a valued field isomorphism. So we have one last thing, thing to check. Uh, F in a way to uh, B of B is a valued field isomorphism. Uh, what's the last thing we need to check? The angular component. Okay, we need to check that it's an isomorphism for the for the L pass structure. Okay, so what about the angular component map? Here we have a nice uh, little, okay, a little remark. Uh, how do I do that? Okay, maybe A, L. We have an extension of valid field such that gamma K is gamma L. Okay, then uh, for any U, okay. U in E in L, there exists, uh, or maybe for any A, which for any A in L, no, not A, B, C, or any C in L, there exists D in O L uh, invertible, um, and C, D, E, and E in K such that C is the product of D and E. Is it clear or should I just, the argument is you take the C, it's, um, its valuation is in gamma K, so you can take a pre-image, that's your E, and then the, the this one is of valuation zero. Okay. It's an exercise. Now I will use this to preserve the angular component map. So now I take any element uh, C in A of A. I write it as C equals B times E. And what's happening to um, F of the angular component of C? So that is good. So this is F of um, AC of B than AC of E, which it is here. Let's do this. Uh, okay, so let's say this one is in O um, A of A times the D, and this one is in A. Okay, so. The element in A, which is a C of a D is in A. So this is because F already is an L pass isomorphism. This is a C of F of D. Because this element is in A. And this is times 
Okay, but T is uh, evaluation zero. What do we know? If it's evaluation zero, it's, it's equal to the residue map, right? This is also res E. And F of res E, it's this one is the same as res of F of E. Why? Why do I claim that it commutes? Because now we, we talk about the residue map, which is only related to the evaluation. It's only given by how is how is the class of F of A via the valuation. But F is already a valued field isomorphism. We commute with the residue map. Uh, right, and so this again leaves it's all, also because it's a uh, it's a valid field uh, isomorphism. This is again of valuation zero. I mean, this is again non-zero. So this is also AC of f of a f of e. Sorry, and so this is AC of f of d times e, which is AC okay of uh, c. Okay, so let's see. Um, so now I, I I've extended my okay. Is this one okay? What did I do? So I took an element a bar in my uh, residue in my residue field sort. Which is not in the residue field of the value valued field A. And I could extend F to an extension of A such that the residue of this guy is this new, this element which was which was in gamma, but not in the residue field A. So now I can just do similarly an induction or just iterate this. Um, to be able to assume that. Yeah. Okay. So this finish uh, step three. What is step three? Now we want to do a little bit the same thing. V of A times, okay, the, the image of the valuation. Is it, is it clear what I okay. would rest yeah. with your <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, okay, what is step three? Now we want to assume that V of A time is equal to gamma. I was anticipating. So how do we do that? It's a little bit similar. Um, ah, sorry. I, okay, so I I didn't do the, the the transcendental case, right? I assumed that a bar was algebraic, but you transcendental case is, is exactly the same, but easier. Why? Because now, if I take a lift of a bar, it's again transcendental over a, and now I, I just have to choose any b, which is a lift of f of a bar. Okay, which will again be transcendental because uh, f of a is transcendental over the the residue field k b tilde, okay, image of k a tilde. Um, okay, so now I have directly a field isomorphism, and using the same formula, which is not here anymore, you just, it's just more just easier because. All the polynomials, okay, first, the, you don't have to choose B uh, very wisely, you just take any transcendental. And then the same formula, the same corollary. Now, um, the residue, okay, now one, A bar, A squared, uh, A bar squared, etc. this infinite family is also linearly independent. So locally, if I take any polynomial, any element in my, uh, which is a polynomial in A, uh, 
its valuation is also given by the minimum of the valuation of the coefficient for the exact same reason. And the same argument works here. I just use to preserve the AC. I just use um, that the extension that I get is uh, does not enlarge the, the value. Okay, just check the notes. It's like it's, it's five lines. It's much easier. Okay, so here again. Okay, now what do I want to do? I take a gamma. Okay, let's gamma a gamma a tilde with the image of a bytes. Then um, and take a gamma in gamma e, but not in gamma a tilde. Now again, there are two cases. The first case is n gamma belongs to gamma a tilde, so if there is token. And the second case, if n gamma does not belong to gamma a tilde or n. So this one is the same as this one in a bit more complicated a bit more annoying, so I will just do the second one and then we can move on to the and maybe I will be a bit hand wavy if I want to to show you the last steps. Okay, so we assume this case. Now what's what's happening if I take an element uh, so in particular in particular um, uh, n gammas are in different classes mode gamma a tilde. So if uh, a belongs to e such that v of a is gamma, what do I know about a? I use my corollary. <laughs> Um, the corollary, which was saying there were two cases in this solar. I mean, there was first a lemma, and then there were two cases. Okay. So the corollary says, corollary, it says that if it was a B, but if it's an A such that, let's say, okay, let's write it properly, V is an extension of A and V, and A is an L. Okay, such that uh, gamma um, uh, zero v of a v of a square are in different classes mod gamma the small one. Then I could explicitly tell you what is the valuation of a linear combination of. Um, of the A to the I's. So V of C I A to the I is exactly the minimum. Okay, now now people have valuation, right? So so I need to take this into account. So the C I plus the I, I mean the variation of these guys. Yeah, the minimum of these valuations. I V of A. So this tells me many. This I will keep. Okay, is it okay? Is it clear what's happening here? I think it's it's a bit more clear. So in particular, so this was the the corollary, but of course now I apply it directly to the extension a of a. Okay. Corollary tells me that because as this is true, then we have this. These those are all elements of, of A of A. Yeah? I mean, okay. I'm a bit, um, I usually identify this with A of A, okay. 
but uh, I'm doing it for polynomials and then there is the slippery step where you take valuation of the quotient when you use the first step to extend it to the fraction field. With the step zero. So what does this, this term mean? What does it imply? What do I know in particular about the element A? A over A over B A. Gamma is not infinity, right? Why not? I mean, it's just I'm taking it in the value group. I'm not taking it to do it. Okay, so in particular, um, this is infinity if and only if all of those are infinity. So if and only if the CI are all zero. Okay, so A is transcendental. Um, it also tells me that the valuation of this field, A of A, is included in, in this group, gamma A tilde plus this new element gamma. You are on this list. Okay. All right, so now let me just, so what do I want to do again? So I know that if I take any A, which is a valuation gamma and which is in E, then A is transcendental over A. Of course, on the other side, uh, if I consider F of gamma, okay, I will take the pre-image of F of gamma, and let's say B, it will also be transcendental. So those two, Field extension will be isomorphic as fields, but also as valuation. As valuation. But if I take them arbitrarily, I will not necessarily have um, that the that the angular component map um, commutes because here we strongly use that the, the group did not grow, so we need to. To choose them a little bit more, more precisely. Right? Okay. Let so assume we have this A. So we, we have an A. Uh, we have this A with V of A plus gamma. What do we know about the residue field of A? The residue of A it belongs to KE. Right. We know more actually. It will be zero. So the residue of A is zero, but A is not zero, right? So what do I know about the angular component of A? It's not zero either. It belongs to uh, KE, okay, without zero. Is this clear? The angular component map only sends zero to zero. Um, Okay, but now by by the previous step, which was step two, by step two, we know that there exists an element uh, u in O, which is which is a valuation zero, such that res of u equals a c of a. Yeah, this is just using that before. I, I added enough elements so that the residue map is onto the residue field. But now I define A prime to be A times U. Yeah, minus one. Oh, yeah. 
And then of course, AC of A prime is uh, what? Yeah. What's the valuation of A prime? Huh? Good. And how is A prime compared to A, say over A? Because A was transcendental over A. I'm multiplying by an element in A. Or if I'm is also transcendental over A. Uh, okay, so because here I have much, much um, choice in my in my pre-image of gamma. I, I just said that because gamma is uh, torsion free over, over the value group of A, then any transcendental, uh, any pre image of gamma will, um, will, transcendent, will be transcendental, but also will, will be in, in, okay, if I take any pre image of gamma in A and any pre image of, gamma, of F of gamma in B, I will, I will have a field isomorphism. And I told you that using similar arguments, namely that the this um, uh, the map F is an isomorphism of group of ordered group, so it will commute with this minimum, essentially the same argument as before. Then I will have a valid field isomorphism between these two pre-image, A and let's say B of F of gamma. But I needed to change a little bit uh, the A so that I, I don't define new. I, I need to commute over uh, with uh, with AC, and now that I have AC of, so now I choose instead of A A prime, which has a, an angular component equals to one. Then uh, essentially I can make the commutation argument work for trivial reasons. Essentially, the analogous of this remark here, because the valuation of of this is in here. If you take any element now in the field. I can divide by a power of A, then I'm in gamma A, and then I can do the same thing as here. So it will not be a product D times E, but it will be D times E times A to the F. And because the angular component of A is one, I will be able to, to control the, the value of the angular component. Okay. Okay, so just quickly the, the, last, the last two steps. <laughs> Let me draw. Ah, it's a shame. Let me quickly draw what we what we have so far. So we have extended a to, to a k e gamma e, and we know that the residue of any element in here uh, that this is the, the residue field of a, and this is the value group of a. So if I take now a new element. In E, it defines an immediate extension. The value, the valuation group will not grow, and the residue field will not grow. Okay, so the idea is first to extend A to the hensterization, extend the, the function from A to the hensterization. This is driven by uniqueness of the hensterian enclosure. And so, what remains, so this is step three. I know this is set for uh, one and then two. I now I can assume that A is in Cedian. Okay. I still have KE and gamma E. And now I take and finally and the last element, an element in E, because it's in Cedian, it does not have so this element will define an immediate extension. And because it's in Cedian, cannot be algebraic. So it will be transcendental. And now what do we use? We have an immediate extension by a transcendental element. We mm -hmm. saw something about this. It's this pseudo Cauchy sequence. So it's so you can find a, a sequence in A. So you have this new A, which is uh, transcendental and immediate. And you can find a pseudo Cauchy sequence in here that converts to A. But the pseudo Cauchy sequence stays in A. So I can look at the image of the pseudo Cauchy sequence 
I find the limit because L is saturated and because of the uniqueness of the way I define the, the valuation on the transcendental to the Cauchy sequence, I get that it commutes with the valuation and the same argument is that it commutes with the angular okay. And so it's good. <laughs> so that is. Before closing the board, I have uh, filled it out uh, in some argument today. Yes, yes. So when you extended F to KP, uh, yes. at the beginning you use compactness, and then we move to to Alec one saturation. But uh, but now I don't understand why the compactness argument doesn't work. I mean the compactness argument. Okay, well, it depends what you call compactness. So compactness tells you that the theory, uh, a theory will be consistent. So it will have a model. So the, the theory that I take is there exists and all those formulas and input uh, parameters. In. If you add a constant for, for in place of the x in the sigma of x, you add a constant to this, then you have a set of sentences and you can prove that this theory uh, is consistent, which means that there exists there exists a model where um, there will be a witness of this. Ah, there exists. The saturation is the is model. saying that yeah, yeah. the separation there exists an element. Yes, the saturation allows you to just apply compactness, but staying the same structure, the same, the same structure. And that's why you you need a bound, right? Because if you say I'm different from everyone, I, of, of of course I cannot have a realization of this. So are there more questions? No questions. So it was a great course and a great effort. So <laughs> we really appreciate it. Thanks again. Which one? Okay. So we can't call. The last thing we've done yesterday is looking at these rights of trees and some examples. And I just want to do one more example to, to give you a bit of more feeling what can happen, or two more examples. So um one more example is say x is some hyperbola like this here so define by x times y equal one and um maybe there's an exercise so um what do you think? I, I mean, okay. If okay, or, or yeah, let's let's do it as an exercise. What do you think is the riser tree of this thing? So riser tree we call means that we look at all the evaluated balls and um we ask how trivial they are. We have this tree TR0 where we are zero trivial and TR1. And I don't recall which colors are used for the different ones, but let me maybe Fix some colors which I've used. So, how, what do you think? How does it look like? So, what is TR0? Zero. Yeah. Well, this is smooth now. But uh, nothing. Okay, so this is what I hope that you would say, and now I can tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, if we take any small ball like this here, then indeed on this ball here will be one tree. So let me draw it in, here this will be a tree picture. And if I take this ball and on this ball, I'm also one trivial. And if I take a ball here, then on this ball, I'm even two trivial, whatever, okay? But I also have this ball here, which is variation ring sized. So, and on this ball, I'm not one trivial, right? And this is, I mean, if you feel a little bit unsure whether I'm one trivial on this ball or not, then recall that a rhizometry at the level of the, if on the valuation ring would induce a translation on the residue field. Now, if I have a set like this here, yeah, look at the image in the residue field, and I just translate it, then it will not be translating the variable. So, um, this ball here 
this is in ER0, and any bigger ball containing that red, red ball here is also in TR0. So this is also all TR0. And then I have some stuff here in TR1 that corresponds to, to my curve here. And each of these here, again, has lots of things in TR1 and so on. And, and I don't draw the TR2 stuff. Um, and I also have, I, okay, okay, so this looks now, I have this red branch here and then only yellow stuff on top here. But I mean, if I look at X, well, or maybe I'm, my picture is X star now. X star also has some stuff here. So in reality, I also have some bigger balls here, which will also be in TR1. So this is a maybe slightly strange phenomenon that my red TR0 simply stops here. But I mean, I, I hope this picture convinces you that this is what happens. Can yeah. you repeat what, which are the bigger TR1 balls? So this ball here, for example, is a ball around some, say, some point far outside of the variation ring. So around e to the minus one of size big or equal to zero or something like this. So this would be some infinite element. Uh, uh, I mean, okay, so this is maybe zero comma e or something like this. Um, okay, now, um, when we say invariant of singularities, yes, we want to say invariant by what? And so, what are classical notions of equivalence of singularities that would make this three invariant? So, like for example, by Lipschitz invariant, or, um, and, or then going uh, analytic invariant is three, no? But, but yeah, good, good, good point. Um, can I first continue speaking about this example here? So, okay. Um, so, okay. So, so one thing which one maybe makes one feel bad about this picture here is um, that, I mean, I have a curve here and points from T, TR zero should be singularities in some sense. So, I mean, okay, we don't have really a point in TR zero, but we have something in TR zero. So where's the singularity? So now I will do a variant of this here where you will see the singularity. So variant, let's take uh, X star. Now actually, maybe I should not call it X star because X star is always a, a non-standard version uh, of some classical set, so Z, this is now really directly defined in R star squared. And here I'm allowing myself now to use parameters from R star squared for this example. Uh, so I pay x times y equals p squared. Okay, how does the set look like? Well, it looks, I mean, t squared is an infinitesimal element. So it looks almost like this here, except that my parabola thing now like looks much thinner, okay? And then the tree will be exactly the same, I mean, essentially the same, except that the red branch will, will go up a little bit further. I mean, so, um, and then I will have the same kind of sum. So the, this end point now is this ball here, okay? And here, now let's take rest of Z. So the image of this set Z, in the residue field. So this will be defined by rest of this polynomial, which is x times y minus p squared, which is just x times y. So p squared becomes zero. So in, I mean, and the image in the residue field it's just a cross like this. And here you see the singularity. And why did you write the square and not the t? Why, why um, yeah, I, I could have used, used uh, I mean, it's actually because I wanted to have that this here is, is, is a valuation for one for convenience. For, for, for convenience. I, yeah, it doesn't make it. So really, 
these are, you can also think of this here, the, this riser trees, they do not only see the actual singularities of my set, but they also see things like if I take some ball and send it to the residue field and get a singularity there, that they also see. And here, for convenience, I took the usual residue map here, but I could do something similar here. I take some huge ball and take some kind of scaled residue map to the to the to the residue field, which sends so and then I will also see singularities on this side. Okay. So this was one piece of interesting information. So, so what's what's the idea? So the tree, as you said, the tree is capturing not only the the the, the, the singularities information of of x, x star, but also some also some kind of some variants of it. No, some 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 some. If you take if you take as x star, you cut out an arbitrary ball, you scale that ball to the valuation ring size, you apply the residue map, and if you get the singularity there, that's seen by the tree. So let's say that I want to study a family of semi-algebraic. So this is useful for families, exactly. When your parameter becomes infinitesimal. I, I, yeah, I literally replace my parameter by an infinitesimal. Absolutely. And way of producing. Exactly. Understanding the geometry. Exactly. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. OK. Now let me give you one more example. Um, so now I'm I'm going back to a classical example. So X, uh, I mean classical in the sense that I don't use parameters from R star. So X or X star, I want it to be some kind of trumpet, something like this here. So this is defined by so this is the X axis. Defined by um, what do I need to say? Y squared plus Z squared equal X cubed or something like this. Okay. Now, um, so this example I want to use to persuade you that the well, okay, I I I, I guess I probably already told you a little bit that the rise of trees contain more information than the rise of certification we already saw yesterday. But this is another instance of this. So what is the riser stratification? Of this thing. So the riser stratification is a partition of the ambient space R3, right? And S0, well, we are certainly not trivial at all trivial at the origin. So this will be the origin. Then. Okay, let's already do the easy part. S3, where am I trivial in three directions? Well, everywhere where I don't meet x at all. So this will be R3 without x. That's boring. And now if I take any point of x, no matter which one, in a small neighborhood, I will be, I mean, I, I, I'm C1. So, so uh, sorry, so C, yes, C1 and it's two dimensions. So S2 will be all the remainder of x. And S1 is 0. Mm -hmm. Now there's something here, which some additional information which we might, might want to have. Namely, if I look, I've imagined that I look at x here in this area, and actually my x is just, well, it's almost translation variant in one direction. And uh, this, I mean, I certainly don't, do, don't see this if I, I mean, if I just take balls of, of, I mean, with my certification essence here, but I mean, the, 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 the balls consisting of in, in the infinitesimal neighborhoods. But if you, I'm, I'm drawing this now in bigger. So suppose this here is the infinitesimal neighborhood of zero. So here I draw the maximal ideal cubed. And now inside this here, I take an even smaller ball. Then 
on this ball, well, an even smaller ball, which does not contain the origin. So maybe this is the ball around. So, so, so here we have x is t0, 0, 0. This is the point here. And of size bigger or equal to, um, it's, I need to take bigger than one so I don't contain the origin. So something like this. Then on this ball, I'm one trivial. So, so the rise of triviality dimension on this ball is equal to one. So this means that the rise of tree, I mean, if, if I draw it again, so red was for TR zero, I have my TR zero, which is again, just the infinite branch corresponding to this point. And so say so here's the valuation ring cubed. And the interesting thing is if I go further up here, and then I branch to the side. Then here I will find some things which are in TR1, so like this ball here. So, and this is, I mean, in the in the real picture, this is saying that actually you have this X here, there's a kind of germ of one dimensional thing coming out of you, which looks a little bit like something one dimensional. And now let me tell you, there are classical stratifications which also see this, namely Mostowski's Lipschitz stratification. So I didn't, I, I will not give you the definition of Mostowski Lipschitz. I mean, this was a really complicated, defined in a really complicated way. So a Mostowski Lipschitz stratification, if I just would take this here, this would not be a Lipschitz stratification. Instead, you have to take into account that there's something kind of one dimensional here. So in the most of this education, you would have to put an S1 somewhere here. And this S1 is completely non canonical. You take, can take any curve along X, and then you get the most of this education. So, I, I mean, this I find very unsatisfactory that you have a certification where you have to choose something completely non canonical, but it's important if you want to see this German thing. And now the Trees here, they capture the same information without doing anything non canonical. So, okay. And so, I guess that's what I wanted to say about, I mean, to advertise these rice of trees. This, this is the example I want to do. Okay. Now, I, I have a question about one example you gave yesterday with the cusp. Mm -hmm. You said that you can see, like, if you write another x to the p plus y to the q, you can see the exponents in the rise of tree. Mm -hmm. But if you actually have like a curve with more Poisson pairs, like if you draw the real picture, mm -hmm. like to me they all look the same. So can that actually? Is it, are there like small balls? That yeah, yeah. Or... I mean, so so I'm imagining you you're thinking of something like I have a yeah, double exactly. branch here and a double branch here, right? I mean, that's what would you like in the real picture? You only see one. I I mean, okay, maybe I need to draw a complex picture or something. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. I mean, this is a good approximation. Yeah, yeah. Let's take this okay. as approximation, and then now if I take a small ball here, on this ball I will be one trivial. And the fiber of this thing will look like this here. And so here, the valuative distance, depending on this distance, maybe here I have valuative distance. So let's say I'm at a distance t to the five or something yeah. like this. And then here I might have distance t to the eight. And here I have maybe distance t to the 11. Yeah. And here t to the 11. And you, 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 so you see this. And if you do this to the carousel construction, what Amy has pictured is really what happens in complex yeah. Yeah. but with more a bit more triviality because of the complex direction. Yeah, but, but, okay. In, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I want to now quickly mention one um so 
I, I wanted to, I kind of promised you to give a little bit of insight into the proofs also of the big results, which I only mentioned yesterday. And all these proofs, I mean, they're, they're more precisely, I prove corresponding statements about the trees, and then this will give the corresponding statement about the, 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 the rise of certification. So one claim was the dimension statement. And so let me write some, something, I'm not sure whether I call, should call it theorem or lemma. Okay, now I decided to call it theorem. So if Z subset, let me write it for valued fields more generally. So this is now a theorem. So Z is in K to the N is definable. Um, then there exists a finite set How do I call, call it Y maybe in KN but that um okay maybe I, let me first say in a picture what I want to say what, what I want to say now is that I mean, my intuition is that, okay, we have the certification, and the certification, I mean, this is one S0 up to Sn, and then we want to say something like in the certification, Sd should be d-dimensional. And now I want to say something similar. I want to, my intuition is that these trees are also some kind of certification, just with more information. So I want to say that Tr0 is zero-dimensional. And zero-dimensional now, in which sense do I mean this? Well, if I recall my examples from yesterday, I had a TR0, which looks like this. So if I look at the endpoints here, I have finitely many endpoints. So this is, what, I mean, it's, if you want the number of endpoints here, the set of endpoints, which is zero dimensional. Um, so in this case, TR0 is just a set of all balls, which contain one of these finitely many points. Okay, and now that, that's what I want to write down. There exists a finite set such that TR0 is something like this. Now I need to slightly change the statement because my TR0, as we have just seen in an example which I just erased, the TR0 could, could also just end at some point, and then I only have TR1 on top of this. And so, and the TR0 might also have more branches. Some of them go to infinity and others end. But the point is that. I still have finitely many points such that, well, TR0 is a subtree of the one going to these points. And that's what I'm writing down here now. So there's a finite set Y such that for every ball in TR0, TR0 be coming from the Z here. Um, so let me write TR I. Right, so three. Um, so what I'm saying is that any ball in this tree here will contain one of these finitely many endpoints. So for all B in TR zero, B is affected. This finite set Y is non-empty. So this is a way to state in some form, give some meaning to the saying that TR0 is zero dimension. Okay. And now um, I might want to say also that TR1 is one dimensional and TR2 is two dimensional and so on. And one can write this down, but this becomes a little bit technical. But actually, this follows from this theorem. In, I mean, we don't even know what it means, but it follows in the following sense. I mean, if I have TR1, so let, let me say, so suppose here's my TR0, and then I, now I forgot already which color I used for TR1 today. Yeah. You know, okay, good. So my TR1, this is some, something here. And so recall this here, since I'm one trivial, this tree is isomorphic to the tree of a line times. And now some tree of something, I mean, now I intersect with one fiber. Okay, now I simply apply this 
theorem to this fiber here. So I now know this thing has finitely many points. So I have finitely many points across a line, so I get something one dimension in some suitable space. So and so this theorem, this is I mean, when one really works with this theory, it's very useful. One can then always do some kind of induction over dimension. One has finitely many kind of bad points one needs to treat that are the ones from here. And then on the remaining part, we are at least one trivial. Every ball is joined from one wheel, why we're one trivial. And so we pick a fiber and work in there. And again, we are back to one dimension less. So this is somehow yeah, a crucial thing for the entire theory to work. And so, um, and actually, I mean, what one directly sees, this certainly implies that our set S0 is finite. Okay, recall, I mean, and now this is in the case. That Z is equal to some X star in R star to the N. Right? Because this is saying um, there are finitely many points in R star to the N. So, I mean, okay, how does recall? So, suppose this is my set X here, and I have some look at some infinitesimal neighborhoods, and I'm wondering. Um, how many of those infinitesimal neighborhoods are only have tri triviality dimension zero? Well, I mean, all of these neighborhoods are disjoint. So if I have um, triviality dimension zero here, it means that here I need to have a point <clears throat> of my set, which I called Y here. And maybe Y has some other points, but it has only finitely many. So I will have only finitely many points. So now I'm, I guess, assuming that my X does something like this. So I have that S0 is finite. And then by some kind of fiber-wise induction argument, I also obtain um, um, that, um, let me write it precisely, SD is contained in uh, the dimension one. And I'm writing it with a contained because we did not yet show that ST is definable. But yeah, okay, so this is um, so this, <clears throat> this means that if, if you, for example, allow <coughs> closed balls to have radius infinity, this means that S0 is contained in TR0, right? S0, I mean, the the the. the I mean, you this, can see these points as as. Well, I mean, so radius infinity. I don't look at radius infinity. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. No, 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 no. I, then that's unnecessary. I mean, S zero. This is about balls of size of the maximal ideal. Ah, right, right, right. You're right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, what I kind of saying is that. This dimension, one of the, I mean, I told you one of the big theorems is that the SD have the right dimension. And this theorem implies everything about dimension. I mean, maybe in reality, one has to first prove some amount of definability first. If you could say, okay, we just need to prove this thing. And this sounds very easy because it's just about TR zero, but in reality, it's the most difficult thing. So in reality, one doesn't prove this here, but one goes directly, but when goes, I mean, here I told you how from the S0 statement to get back the SD statement. In reality, one does it the other way around. One proves that SD has dimension at most D, and, and then you make it smaller and smaller. And well, anyway, so, okay, I guess that's what I wanted to say. And then, wait, I mean, so one thing to keep in mind is that this makes the trees, in some sense, rather easy. I mean, they you can control your entire setup to write symmetry in a quite, I mean, you have good control because you always, if you're D trivial, then you pick out five lines, and the five you only have finitely many points, which are evil. And, and that's what you essentially. Uh, 
I'm thinking about uh, maybe it's very difficult to draw all the trees, right? Even yes. with a computer. So maybe the difficulty comes from this kind of drawing because uh, this theorem it means for every for every element of TR zero. So it means you need to consider all the elements. Maybe that's the difficulty. Well, I mean, no, all the elements of TR zero is easy to draw. The TR zero really looks like something like this. Here's a picture. Okay. But TR zero is not fractal at all because of this theorem. TR zero can have only finitely many branching points. So TR zero is the one tree which I can easily draw. But actually, but it's it's good that you ask this question because I mean, what's difficult is to draw TR one. However. Now, TR1 is also easy to draw because instead of drawing the actual TR1, I just say this is equal to a line times, and here again, I just need to draw some zero dimensional tree. So now I drew a nice picture of TR1. And then if I have TR2, I repeat this. And so in the end, I mean, with the right notation for my pictures, I can actually draw all the trees quite easily. I mean, okay, what's a bit difficult still is that your TR1s coming here out. At every point, so this is cannot be avoided. But um, anyway, okay. So now, um, ah, yeah, there's one little thing. I, I, I kind of, I mean, I would like. So when I'm doing something like this here, I'm telling you that my TR one is actually a line cross something like this here and then this tree here is really the tree of a fiber right i mean this is what i was raised here i mean okay so here maybe i have some ball where my set x looks like three lines more or less and then the fiber i mean this thing here is the tree of the fiber here and so I'm applying this theorem to the definable sex, which I get by this fiber. However, this fiber, I mean, the set is definable to define that set. I need this parameter A, the x coordinate. So, and this was not allowed in my original language. So, here, I should rather prove this theorem in a bigger language, which I call L prime, and where L prime. It's L union, and now I'm allowed arbitrary parameters from K. Okay, and while I'm already changing the language, it will soon turn out that we want even more. And as you already see it a little bit, maybe that maybe I want to consider the fiber only within this ball here, right? I mean here, and this means now I have to intersect my sets my fiber with a valuated ball. And so if I do want to do this properly, I also need a valuation in my language. So let's also put in the valuation. And now I'm writing it very sloppy. So you can think of this. So, so, so let me maybe put it in quotation mark. So maybe the better thing to write, I use this three sorted language which you've seen in the morning every day, um, but union by parameters from K to change. And so this theorem is really for this bigger language. Okay. And okay, now you now you might got get frightened a little bit because now suddenly does this language, so let's remove this again, does this contain L, our original language? So in the original language, I allowed myself to put in the inequality, the, 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 the order also. And well, it turns out that I don't need the order here because I can define, so without, I mean, a less or equal to B, this can be defined as the existence X such that B minus A is X squared. So whenever I have A formula, I can throw out the order and write it like this instead. And in this way, I can turn any formula in my original language into a formula in this language, 
So this is not that difficult. Yet. Okay. So now I and okay, and we'll see in a minute that we need this bigger language also in various other ways. And yeah, so now I want to um tell you a little bit about the other big theorem, namely definability. And um and definability of the sets at D. And actually um I will more precisely, I mean the idea is I want to kind of say that these rights of trees are definable in some sense. And once the rights of trees are definable, then from that I will get the definability of the SD. And so and so the thing is that I mean these rights of trees for the moment they are defined as using by saying there exists the right symmetry doing something. And and if this is um this looks quite non-definable, and then a model theorist cannot do anything with it. I would really want to, as a model theorist, to be able to say something. I mean, use this notion of being in, being detrivial or existence of a right symmetry. I would like to be allowed to use this in formulas. And so that is this is really the right theorem when it's approved, I would say. And then this, and then everything else will follow. So let me write this down. So this is paragraph eight, I think. So this is definability. So theorem one. And I write down the theorems in a sloppy way now. And I will have to explain what I exactly mean by this. But maybe you have can have to get a guess what I mean. So given a set of Z. In and I'm writing this again in my more general value field k to the n, which is L prime definable. So I will know always that in this bigger language L prime. And some valuative ball. Um and in the integer D. So then I can ask, is Z D trivial on B? Okay. Um, D triviality of Z on B is a definable, is an is this language a prime definable condition? Now, this really doesn't make sense. I don't know whether you notice that this doesn't make sense. I mean, the way I wrote it down is we are given a set Z uh, and a ball B and a D. Okay, then this will either it will be d trivial on B or it will not be d trivial on B. So I don't need a formula. I mean, it's either true or false. Right? So the question was what do I really mean by this? I, okay, this is maybe a key, key point. So, so please, uh, I should maybe wait. Until you got that, this does not make sense. I don't know whether somebody is confused. Right? I mean, uh, yeah. So, so, so I, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, so. I mean, the thing is that you're not talking about subsets. This is the problem. No, I mean, the thing is that I mean, okay. Let's let's try to apply the theorem to do something. So we have some defined set Z, maybe this one. We have some ball, this one. We have D equal one. And I want a formula which tells me whether I want to be on this ball. Why not just take the formula which is saying yes. So 
So this is stupid. I mean, that, that, actually the formula, I mean, the formula is just sentence. And so then the sentence is either true or false. The problem is that you shouldn't fix Z. Or... Uh, so the problem is I should not fix Z and B. Exactly. And the right way to, to, to do this, uh, the, to, to repair this, is let's say that this is actually depends on some parameter C. And this also depends on some parameter C. So let me write this, and then maybe I should write. So, so um, and then it makes sense because then the statement will become a statement about this parameter C. So let me um, make. Um, so this is so this is one would call would call an L definable family. So all L. Define definable with this additional parameter C. I can also write it like this here and use. I mean, here I'm thinking of C as a as a variable, and this is also somehow. Uh, I, okay, let, let, let me write on the example to make precise what I mean. So let's, for example, take um, uh, our trumpet. and. I want to express the fact that if I take some fiber here at a certain distance, so so say this is this is this is the point A, I want to say that inside this fiber, so here I have a little circle, and I want to say that if I take balls of sufficiently small radius, then of a, on every each one of these balls I'm one trivial. So maybe that's something I might want to express as a model series. So let me write this down. So I want to say, so let me call the trumpets, this is X star. So I want to say for every A, um, there exists A, let me write it like this in, in, in R star, there exists a radius of balls here, this is this one, lambda, in the value group such that for every ball now in this two-dimensional space for so this for every I want to say for every ball I can say for example I, I fix the center of the ball so for every b in r star square and now I want to say the fiber of x star at a is D trivial is one trivial on the ball B around the point B of radius big or equal to lambda. Okay, now this here is a priori not at all an L prime formula. However, this here is parameterized by some parameter a, and this is parameterized by some parameters b and lambda. So maybe I write my what I call c in the theorem will be a tuple consisting of a, b, and lambda. And then these are both parameterized by c. And then here, um, when I wrote by an a defined condition, so this means that I want some, um, so maybe I should write it down, i.e. There exists an L formula, L prime formula, phi of C, which holds if and only if the above things for all the corresponding formulas um, expressing the above. And so this theorem is exactly telling me that after all, there is a formula, L prime formula phi of C, expressing this here. And so this means once I know that the theorem is true, I can just pretend that one triviality is something which I'm allowed to write in my formulas. And then as a model theorist, I become really happy. And you use parameters to not leave the first order logic world. Exactly, I use parameters to not leave the first order logic world. Absolutely, that, that's why I'm like to say. Okay, and so 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 that this is this is one. So this theorem, of course, I mean this is one of the big theorems, and this theorem 
is proven in common induction, in a common induction with another theorem, which is also nice in this context, namely, given, I don't know, maybe Z, C, and Y, C, now a two set in K to the N, And, or maybe let's call it this one Z prime C, sorry. And then I have two balls in K to the N. I can ask if the isometry from that ball to that ball, which sends this set to this set. Okay, so the condition um, let me write it like this. It's, it's definable by an um, or the existence. Okay, let me write it. So there exists an L prime of C formula phi of C expressing. that there exists a rhythmetry alpha from B C to B prime C sending which sends sort of alpha of Z C on this ball B C is equal to the Z prime C on the ball B prime C. Okay, and this is also great because then suddenly, I mean, I, I can write in my formula, there exists a right symmetry from here to there. And you can already imagine that, I mean, D triviality is defined using, by saying something like there exists certain right symmetries and uh, so, so suddenly this theorem follows from that one. That's actually not very difficult. Um, however, if you want to really prove them, I mean, you prove them by common induction and you do have to work somewhat more. You cannot simply deduce that one from that one because you need to deduce that one from this one in lower dimension. It becomes more complicated. But anyway, so at least one sees that they are kind of really closely related. Okay. Alpha does not depend on C, like or so. Ah, yeah. So, so, so good point. So here the thing is that this formula expresses that there exists an alpha, but this alpha is not at all a model theoretic object. I mean, I I I, I didn't put a say C here. I mean, in reality, it depends on C, of course, but not in a defined way. So it's, it's really, I mean, when I say for every epsilon there exists a delta, I do not always write delta epsilon. So, but it depends. On C, of course. But uh, yeah, so this is really, I mean, in reality, I will have to avoid speaking about alpha in some sense. I mean, the, the, the actual formula will not be able to mention alpha because alpha is not even something defined. And so it might be a bit frightening. How can such a theorem be true? This is really, I mean, it feels like, I mean, yeah, and it might feel a bit frightening, but now let me tell you that we've seen an instance of, of this already. So, maybe recall, so let's do a very special baby case. And let's ask, well, so let's say what my ball B prime is just, um, it, it is, it's just valuation ring square or something like this. And my set uh, Z prime is just a horizontal line, maybe, or maybe the horizontal line inside this ball. And we can ask, does then, so here if I set uh, an arbitrary set Z, and let's take here the same ball. And we can ask, is that a right symmetry from here to here? And we've seen on Wednesday 
that we can express this by a first order formula. So there exists a right symmetry from Z. Well, let me write this stop even from, from Z um, intersected O square to Z prime intersected o, o square. In reality, it's a right symmetry. Maybe you should say the pair. Anyway, let me write exactly the right symmetry like this. Um, um, with alpha z equals z prime, if and only if, and what we found out in our exercise session was, firstly, we have to write for every x here, there exists exactly one z y such that x y is in z. So this was expressing that this is the graph of the function. And then if I call this y here, y of x maybe, or, or, or let, z of x, I don't recall how the function was called, then uh, I can additionally say that this function g of x satisfies, and for our x1, x2 um, valuation of g of x1 minus g of x2, that was a condition called star at some point. Maybe we will call it. So we saw that this is an if and only if. So here now, we yeah. have first order formula, which expresses this thing. Yeah. This rhizometry is not definable. In this case, the rhizometry happens to be definable. That's true. But this is not always true. But this is not always, yes. Yes, I mean, OK, let me, OK, I can say a little bit something. At some point, I told you that, I mean, when I was gluing things together, I was telling you that we will definitely for this gluing, need rhizometries which are not definable. Yeah. Rhizometry I obtained from the gluing process are actually definable in the language L prime because L prime now is the valuation. However, there are still some very bad examples which I won't present here where it's not definable at all. So, but yeah, okay. Anyway, so so this really the exercise which we did on Wednesday. This was kind of one of the key ingredients to the proof of these theorems. So it's, it's kind of an ingredient to both of these theorems, depending on how you think about it. Um, so I think I have time to mention another key ingredient to the proof, just, just to give you, um, so I mean, so yeah, key ingredient, basic, um, baby step, whatever. Um, so let's maybe try to prove theorem two for n equal one. So we, meaning we have two defined subsets of K itself, and we want to know whether there's a right symmetry between them. Um, so, now, okay, any well, okay. 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 one, thanks. And depends on the set, no? Oh, oh. That depends on the, actually, yes. So, I'm, I'm, I should really put C here. Here, I didn't put a C either. Maybe I should have put a, a C here also. Okay, let, let's be a bit um, cleaner. Um, the thing is, I mean, I tend to just want to drop the C and I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I guess before I told you the thing about that the theorem doesn't make sense, you probably had the feeling that it does make sense and you probably had the right intuition of what it's supposed to say. So I, I, I tend to want to just I don't write the C's and I think C in some, I mean, I just, I will just construct some formula which does the right thing. And then if there are parameters, then one can plug in the parameters and it's fine. But if you prefer, I can, I mean, maybe I should rather write the C's so that I don't write something wrong. So what we know, so how can we express that there exists a right symmetry between now two arbitrary sets? I 
a priori this might seem rather hopeless, right? I mean, if, I mean, however, we know that these sets are defined. And so we know how the rise, rise of tree of a defined set looks like. At least we know how the TR0 looks like. Namely, Z, B, and so they are definable. So maybe um, let's uh, should, should write it down. Let TR01 and TR. I, okay, I is only zero and one here, and TR prime B, there, right, the trees. Um, and then, um, because they are definable, we can apply the previous theorem, which I erased. Um, there exists finite set, y0 and y1 in k such that um well let me make maybe i don't want to erase this in the safe side um y0 over y depend on c uh, they also depend on c exactly good points um sorry and uh, sorry there's there, i want to call them y c y y c and y c prime such that um, um for every ball now let me write it the opposite way around for every ball not in t of and then the proof of that theorem you have to prove you have to be careful to to deduce that these sets are definable the y absolutely i exactly the theorem which i wrote down on the previous board i was not i didn't write it precisely enough and the more precise statement is that if I have set parameterized by some C, like this one, then I can choose my finite set also to be definable using this parameter. Absolutely. So that's um, uh, that's something which is indeed true. I and mean, that's the version, the, the real proper version. So there exists a set so that for all ball B disjoint from these finite sets. So uh, in K, that's that E, Y, C is empty. We have that B is not in TR zero. And not in TR zero in this case, of course, that means B is in TR one because that's only TR zero and TR one. And in TR1 means that um, Zc is one trivial on B. And now recall, I have a one that, I mean, I said, and the Hamlin space is one dimensional. I'm asking for one triviality. So this means that actually the entire ball B is either entirely contained in Zc or disjoint from Zc. So B in the second ZC is either empty or the entire ball B. Okay, and then okay, I wrote this for, for YC and similarly with prime. Okay, so this is good. So maybe let me draw a picture of how this looks like now. So my set ZC, so this is my K. And so I have finitely many points. So this is maybe my finite set YC, such that if I take any ball this joint from these finitely many blue points, this ball is either entirely contained in Z or disjoint from Z. So I'm, I can say I can cut 
all the part outside of, I take all the, actually I can just take always the maximal balls disjoint from the blue points. And each of these balls is either completely inside or completely outside of my set ZC. So ZC will contain some of these balls and it will not contain some other ones. And it might contain some of the blue points and might not contain some of the other ones. Okay, and maybe I will now finish the proof of this case with hand way we leave it by drawing pictures. So uh, let me draw the picture again. Maybe let me just draw two points. So here for the set ZC, say I have this two blue points, Y, T. And for the set ZC prime, I have two other points, Y, uh, Y, T. Y prime C. Okay. And I want to find the right symmetry from here to here. Um, then, okay, let's additionally suppose now I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit. Let's suppose that we choose those sets YC here minimal. And then if I want the rhizometry from here to here, then certainly I will have to send this point to this one and this point to this one. So if I want that there exists a rhizometry, I certainly need that this vector is almost equal to this vector. I mean, this difference vector. So now this is something I can express using formulas because this is just, this is a finite set. I can just enumerate all these finitely many elements in my formula, I can call them I1 up to An, and this one I call B1 up to Bn, and then I write down A1 minus A2 has the same Rv as B1 minus B2, and so on. So if I let me write this down, so maybe this is A1, A2, B1, B2, and in my formula I write, will write something. So, so um, Rv of A1 minus A2, equal Rv of B1 minus B2. Okay, and then what else do I need to do? Well, now I need to check, I mean, for each of the balls here, I know that such a ball is either con entirely contained in my set or it's entirely outside. Now I have the corresponding ball over there, meaning, I mean, if I have a certain I mean, this point plus a certain uh, certain distance here, I look at the corresponding ball over there. And if I want to have a right symmetry, and this ball lies in Z, C, then I have to impose that this ball lies in Z, C prime, Z prime C. OK, and so on, and, and, but, and once I've imposed this, I'm done because each of these balls, I mean, I don't need to say anything else about these balls. I mean, once I know that this one is complete, if this is inside and then this is inside, and if here I have another ball which is not inside and this one is not inside, then I will be able to construct the right symmetry between these two sets. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I didn't give full details here, but this maybe gives you a little bit of an idea how this theorem from before allows you to, to really construct the right symmetry. Since what is that ZB and ZC prime are uh, actually sets, scramble, and how do you know that uh, YC and YC prime have same numbers? Yes. 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 So, so, okay. So, so, so there, there are two questions here. So, firstly, if they have, okay, they might have different numbers of points. If I take them both minimal and have different numbers of points, then there cannot be a right symmetry. I mean, so yeah. you're right. I should put this into the formula. Formula should actually say they have the same number of points. There's a second danger, which uh, is a good question is, I mean, couldn't it be that the number of points becomes bigger and bigger when I change my parameter? I mean, that it's unbounded. And because here my formula, then I have a problem because my formula, I want to say for all A1 up to AN, I want to enumerate the points in my formula. So my the length of my formula should be bounded by some n here. But this is also part of the previous theorem, which I didn't write precisely, 
if I have a family of defined sets, then actually the cardinality of the set also has a fixed bound, independent of the parameter. Okay, maybe this was a bit technical, but so this hopefully gives you a little bit an idea of a proof of these theorems. And I mean, the real difficult part, I will not even mention. So, but this, um, okay. So now let's believe the theorems. I mean, this is, I mean, this is really the, the hard work proving them, but let's now believe them. And let's look at what they are useful for. And oh, I raised something which I wanted to reuse now. So let's, um, let's see, let's try to prove something, a theorem which is probably known, but I'm not so sure whether it's, um, well, I mean, so let's look at our trumpet again. So, and now, so one thing we can ask is if we take the x coordinate a here, and this is a certain variative distance from the origin, so this is, I'm drawing it, so v of a, and then I can ask what's the radius of the circle here? Radius of the circle. This is, um, uh, okay, this will be, I mean, actually, I want radius, I want evaluation of the radius of the circle. Or maybe you could also say the size of the ball containing that circle or something like this. So um, this is, will be evaluation of, um, actually, this is, this radius, I, I gave this example here where I was asking what is the, I mean, there exists some lambda such that all balls of radius lambda are one trivial inside the fiber. So actually, this is essentially it's this lambda which I'm speaking about, or more or less. So um, relation of let me write it radius of circle. Okay. So we have a map. I mean, and then one can check that this variation of the radius of the circle only depends on the variation of a. So we have a map from the value group to the value group which sends the variation of a. To the variation of this radius. Now, this let me call this map here. I don't know u. This map u is a prime. I, I mean, okay. If I use my formula from before, I, I told you I can express this using triviality and so on. Actually, I mean, here I don't even need triviality the way I wrote it. But I mean. If I would use, I mean, okay. Anyway, so this is now a prime defined. Now recall that L prime is the language which you've seen in the morning always. It's this three sorted language. So we have quantified information in this language, and we can get rid of value field quantifiers. So here we have a formula defining a map from the value group to the value group. So meaning we have a formula defining the graph of this. Thing. So, um, by a formula, phi say of lambda one and lambda two, and these are both gamma variables. And then, if you look, I mean that that's something which which uh, Christian also kind of said that if you look at such a formula with, I mean this formula has no quantifiers over the value fields, and it has no variables over the value field. So essentially you can put nothing about a valued field in the formula. And there's also nothing from the residue field. So it turns out that, okay, modulo some little details, this formula is without loss, a pure ordered abelian group formula. So by quantifying in a verb from this morning, phi is an ordered abelian group. So ordered abelian group means formula in this language, I mean, interpret it on the, on, the, on the value group. Now my value group here, recall that my R star I'm working on is R T to the Q, so the value group is Q. Now another quantified nation result, which I guess has not been proven in this summer school is that in Q, with this language, you also have quantified in nature. So by 
there, so this is then a has QE, so the one from this morning, by QE in Q, phi is quantifier free without loss. Okay. Now, a quantifier free in this language, if you think about it, there's not so much left you can express. And it turns out that, so a quantifier free defined a function. So you need to define a graph of function. This only thing you can do is piecewise linear. So this implies that mu is piecewise linear. Okay. So, and this is, I mean, I showed this now in full, you know, I, I didn't show something about the trumpet, actually. This is all this, this argument, I work in complete generality. So if I'm asking, how does the valuation of the radius depend on this valuation? I know that what can happen is maybe, um, so something like, valuation of the radius, equals maybe three times valuation of A um, if valuation of A is uh, less than one and maybe five times valuation of A plus nine if valuation of A is big or equal to one or something like it. So that's the kind of functions you get. And, um, and actually, so I said piecewise linear, and it lives in Q, so this piecewise linear will, will be with rational coefficients. So I get some rational coefficients here. So I get for free that, I mean, if I look at this in some infinitesimal neighborhood of my singularity here, I can read off some rational numbers from the singularity. So this is somehow just this general nonsense of quantified relation gives me sort of for free. Some, some 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 numbers, and this is so. I, I now did the example of the, of this of this trumpet thingy. But if you also recall, I mean, yesterday I was also looking at this function where we had three over two appearing in, in, in the class curve. So this three over two, this was really I had a function lambda here, and then so this was my 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 tr zero, and then my tr one. I was doing something like this here, and we had three over two times lambda. So this function of lambda also is piecewise linear, whatever my curve here is. So, um, okay. so this is one. This one application of of, of now, and now I can apply model theory to this and combine with this quantified elimination. I can draw a lot of nice information out of this. And the other thing I want to say, yeah, okay. Second application now is, uh, let me also maybe call this corollary. And that's the thing which I really, I mean, I promise you, FD is definable. Uh, so this is uh, now in, again, we are back, back in R star and so on. So given F in R n a definable, we want to deduce as S is defined. Okay, now you should not yet believe me that this follows for several reasons. So one is that these terms say L prime definable. And that's the valuation inside. And this is really a problem. I mean, this is, if you have a valuation inside, I mean, as the valuation, I mean, as B, this is the subset of R to the N, the valuation doesn't even make sense. I mean, and, and actually that's the other thing. I mean, this is a subset of R to the N and not of R star to the N. So how do I get back from the R star side and the language with valuation to the, something in R being definable in a language without variation. Okay. Maybe I can wake you up. Does anybody has a suggestion? So, 
to R. Yeah, yeah. So, so when could transfer from R star to R, that's indeed one useful thing one could do. But then we don't, we are not able to get rid of the valuation. But but it's a, it's a very good good idea. I mean, this would have been my first idea also. Um, and I mean, maybe one can actually get something. But well, anyway, maybe in QP there is a valuation back. When transfer to I want to go to QP and then to yeah oh, oh. but then go, go, going from QP to R will not I mean we will not be that easy because I mean they are not yeah 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 okay may, maybe I need to tell you I don't know whether one can guess it so what is SD so let me write it again so this is the set of A in R to the N such that the rise of triviality dimension of my set X star on the ball, infinitesimal ball around A, is equal to D. Okay, if I write it like this, this is, I mean, this is also, I mean, it's model, model theoretically bad because I'm mixing two structures. I'm, make, I'm having R star here and I'm defining a subset of R. However, if, so this is now, let me write it the same thing. So here, this is R, R n is, of course, a subset of R star to the n. So I'm, I'm wondering, I want to define something in a, in a substructure. I mean, this, this kind of doesn't work properly. Let me write exactly the same thing again, except that now I think of this R as the residue field of R star. And then here, this here is just the pre-image under on the, on the residue map. So for model theorists, it does make a big difference whether I consider R, R as a subset of R star or whether I consider as uh, its residue field. Now these two R's are kind of different, but nevertheless, I mean, as a non-model theorist, I don't mind. These two sets are just the same. So if I, so let's look at this one. Now this is in my three sorted language. This is a nicely a prime definable language. Uh, set. Why? Because by my big theorems here, by by the first one, this here is expressible by a formula. So this is definable, a prime definable by theorem one. Okay. Moreover, it's a subset of the residue field. Now I use quantified elimination again. So, so by a formula phi of say, let me write x one bar up to xn bar, I'm writing also bars like, like, like Christian for the residue field variables. So now this is a, again, so by then a plus quantified elimination, I, I, I'm not sure, did Christian say that this is how the quantified elimination is called, which he proved? So the version of quantified elimination, which Christian proved is called then a plus quantified elimination. That's how I, so by this formula, I can, by this quantified elimination, I can assume that phi has no, without loss, no valued field quantifiers. And since the only variables it has is residue field variables, it again turns out that without loss, this is a formula which lives purely in the residue field. So this means that phi is that a field formula, a ring formula in the residue field. So it's an N formula on the residue field. And here we have what we want. So now, I mean, this is another kind of magic trick, I think. So we have first definable ability using the valuation and we get rid of it. And we find this. Finally. You use that the residue field is really embedded. I mean, there, there is a, the fact that these two sets are yeah. really equal. <laughs> yeah, the fact that these two sets are equal, this is somehow used. That's some, of, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the A up is to some extent not exactly the same A 
down, but it for, is right. right. Because, yeah. yeah, so for model theorists, these are two different A's. For non-model theorists, they are the same. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I think this is all I want to say about all these big groups. I guess I gave you several flavors of what's happening. And also I managed to make the connection to the other mini course. And um, so so now maybe I want to make a few more remarks if I find my right piece of paper. Yes, so let's say this is um, somehow ends one piece of the, the biggest part of this mini course we are trying to understand the, the certifications. Now, let me just, I, so I want to finish by first making a few remarks about that this actually I mean, I chose to work in a rather specific setting for this mini course, but various things work a bit more generally. And I want to say a little bit, just a few remarks about this. And afterwards, I will use the rest of the time to show you a little bit how this can be applied to Poincare series. So let's have some, something completely different and fun and see how, 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 this is, uh, how this is useful. So let me, maybe I do this remark on how this generalizes. And then, if we want, we can have a five minute break or so, um, because then the, the point carry is section. So, all this work more generally. And uh, so, this can be generalized in various different ways. So, I started instead. of the language L, which was the language of ordered rings, union R, can also use um, more powerful languages, so which can express more. Like, so now this is for people who know that so the sub-analytic language. So this will mean that I, in my language, I put in lots of analytic functions as new symbols in my language. And then I can define sets using these analytic functions. And I mean, I have to be a bit careful what exactly I put in. And if I do this correctly, then the entire theory works with this language. So you get stratifications SD. You start with a set defined in the bigger language, you get a stratification SD that will also be defined with a bigger language. And yes, everything goes through. Of course, then the L prime will also have to be a bigger language. And that is definitely not possible anymore to use just then a fast sound of elimination. But there is a version of then a past kind of elimination for this bigger language. And that's why all this goes through. And so maybe for, for, for experts, I can say in general, you can use any polynomially bounded whole minimal language. And I have a question. Because in algebraic geometry, you have several topologies, like ital, formal, and yeah. uh, f because Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, yeah. Uh, all the, could, could this be generalized? To, to that kind of situation? So, I mean, so right now I've been using the usual, the classical topology here all the time. Um, I, okay, let me first say a few yeah. more things and then I come back. I mean, yeah, I mean, okay, maybe the honest answer to you question is I don't really know how to make sense of these different topologies exactly in, in this. Uh, so what does it even mean to have a different of these topologies? But yeah. And what um, other languages, what are the problems with other even more powerful languages like including an exponential? So the problem is if, if you include an exponential, then on this, I mean, on problem, which I mean, could be a solution. I mean, so here you don't 
have a kind of, I mean, the, you still have some kind of quantum elimination for this L prime language, but not good enough anymore to have the theory working. So I'm saying this rather sloppy. I think one can construct How did this work? I vaguely recall that actually I can, I mean, there's a theorem which I told you that, that you have only finite many points in the TR0 tree. I think you can really have a counterexample to this in, in, in some other language. Let's see if you have the term here. I don't recall how the example really worked. Aha. No, it was not the counterexample for this. Okay, I have to check. I vaguely recall, so at some point there was a problem. I had, I had some counterexample or something. I think this meant that we would not get a witness certification at the end. So it means that somewhere in the, something has to break down in the proof. I, I don't recall exactly. I can think of what it's maybe. Yeah. So anyway, the thing is that the, the theory which you get on the valued field here, I mean, for this language, the model theory, this works very nicely if you have a polynomially bounded language. Then it really works almost like the, 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 the ring language version. And if you add the exponential, then you still have some rather nice model theory, but not that nice anymore. Okay. Then the other thing is, I mean, I used R because, because I don't know, because I, I like to draw real pictures, but all this also works with C instead of R. And when I say C, this means I'm thinking still of C with analytic topology. So what happens if I do it with C? I will, so this means now I have to define the subset. Uh, so, and, and then here I should maybe uh, use the ring language because the order doesn't make sense anymore. So where L is not the ring language. And then when I say something like, I, so I have my define a set X and C, and I say I get a stratification into sets S0 up to SD or some, something like this, then the dimension will be the complex dimension. So this really, it's not the same as identifying C with R square, but I really get complex defined sets and I get complex dimensions and so on. But apart from that, everything looks very similar. And here, of course, then I will use C star instead of R star from elementary extension of C. And this C star, I can take it to be the previous theories over C, for example, and one can get everything. I mean, this in some sense even easier than R because algebraically closed makes life easier. Okay. Uh, by the way, so here, I, I, I mean, maybe I can give a little bit of an answer to what you're saying. So here, I'm thinking of C in the in the analytic topology. Now, the topological things I'm talking about. You, I mean, those which I talk about, you can also use the Zariski topology. It doesn't make a difference. So for the final set, being closed, the Zariski topology is equivalent to being closed in the analytic topology, I think. And so all the intermediate topologies, they would probably also give the same. I think almost all, I mean, almost all the topologies that you use in algebraic geometry is in some analytic. Yeah, so, so yeah. it's, it's yeah. kind of in there yeah. somehow. I yeah. don't know how to make it. So. Okay, and if you want to be really fancy, then, um, ah, no, so, sorry, let me first do the less fancy, um, or uh, more generally, for any k, little, little k, let me call it little k, that, oh, R with this real close or algebraically close. Okay, I mean, and this is 
stupid model theory uh, thing. I mean, if I'm really close, I'm ele elementary equivalent to the reals. So anything which a model theory can do in reals, you can do in a or she in a in a really close field. So it works more generally. I, I should I, but I should say uh, off characteristic zero. But this is of course not. I mean, for an algebraic geometer, there's nothing special about C. So, and, and indeed, the entire theory works in any algebraic closed field of characteristic zero. Okay, and if you really fancy, um, yeah, you can even take K to be the periodics. So the periodics is a topological field, and you can make sense of what stratifications should be in there using the topology from there, and apply the entire machinery. So then my field which I call big K will be QP as a non-standard model of this. And when you are here, you should get completely confused because now you have two valuations around. So one coming from QP, which naturally extends to the entire extension, and another one, which is the one which we got anyway on non-standard things. And at least the valuations are different. And um and it looks a bit messy, but actually it just works. Maybe it's a stupid question, but does it really cross really algebraically close implies characteristic zero? So algebraically close? Yeah, yeah really close anyway. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So the current is this how like this. Okay, okay. Yes. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you do the real close case, you which topology do you put the topology of the other order? You sorry, is the topology. I uh, yeah, I put all the topology, and I have in mind that for the final sets, they they don't notice that it's totally disconnected. What do you do in the algebraically close case? Uh, yeah, I don't recall exactly. Um, I guess, I mean, okay, here I think I use some kind of workaround. I choose some real close subfields. I take the other topology there and use this to put a, a kind of analytic topology on the algebraic closed field. Okay, so you, you invent a kind of analytic topology. I, I invent a kind of analytic topology. And but because actually the results like anyway only depend on the Zariski topology, it turns out that it doesn't matter. I mean, for the final sets, as I said, being closed in the analytic topology is equivalent to being closed. In the Zariski topology, so the choice of the analytic topology doesn't matter. Uh, well, when you are with the periodics, uh, it, why, why do you have to go to the non-standard non ex extension? I mean, you already have like infinite decimals in the periodics. Yes, but I'm, it depends on what you want to do. I want to look at, I mean, if you define a certification, I want to say that certification should say something. What if I approach some? I mean, the question is, what, what do you mean by infinitesimal? And when I'm thinking of this as a topological field, then infinitesimal means now I let me read the valuation go to infinity. So that's just that's, that's, well, I mean, you, you could also say I directly take this as my big K. Yeah, that's what I mean. And but then you will this will tell you something different. I mean it's also interesting, but it will tell you something different. But and moreover the I should, theory work because the residue field is positive characteristics. Moreover, I should say that this the, the big theory doesn't work right now because it's positive characteristics. Yes. But actually, let me write another example. Why I can take little k to be another little, even smaller k, double parenthesis t, and this one of characteristic zero. So here you really have the two options of taking this directly as a big K or passing to an elementary extension. Anyway, this is maybe just to tell you that you can have lots of fun. And actually, it might even be interesting to compare the two things, which you guess when you either go to a bigger K or you don't. And um, I didn't do the comparison yet. And because, I mean, you really get, it's really confusing to have these different valuations around. But yes, it's nice. I got confused. Sorry, sorry. In, in the case of QP, one way was just take an elementary extension. I do exactly the same 
as before, I take and insert a complete elementary extension. I do all my riser trees in this very complete elementary extension using the valuation, which is not the one from QP, but the one which captures order of magnitude where elements of QP are all considered as having long or zero. Yeah. And then I do the entire theory and I get some sort of equations. In you should totally forget the valuation and see this as a field. Yes, exactly. And then where are the valuation here? Yeah, it's just, I mean, in, in, in some sense, I mean, the reals I've using, been using the absolute value to define what I mean by small balls in the reals. And this, I've used this valuation to define small non valuated balls in some sense. And actually, I mean, at some point, I don't recall exactly, Klüker's Leuser Forêt, maybe, or no, Klüker's Leuser. And so some people proved that there exist witness certifications in QP. And here, this whole thing also gives you the witness certifications in QP back by passing to this QP sum. So in some sense, I mean, all this formalism also gives you now a uniform way to show the existence of witness certifications in R and C and QP at the same time. OK. Um, yes. Should we have a short break? And should I, I mean, I can tell you now a little bit something about Poincaré series. Or if you're completely exhausted, we can also completely stop, or whatever you prefer. So we should finish at uh, uh, 45. So up to the persistence of the audience, I would suggest to follow. To so continue, you mean? To continue. So, so are you fine with that now jumping into Cranker Research? Okay, so then I think I need to quickly say what Frank Harry series are. So this is now paragraph, last paragraph application to Frank Harry series. And I will have to be very handwavy. So, um, and so now let's for a moment completely forget everything I did so far. I just want to explain you what the Frank Array series is. And I want to let simplicity, let's work in a periodic numbers. And let's suppose we have a subset of QP to the end. And um, actually, I should also say for the experts on Poincaré series, there are two variants of Poincaré series. I will use a variant which is a bit less common, but which is quicker to explain. In, in quicker to explain in my context. So um, my set Z, maybe let me draw the picture. Maybe it's this one. And then here I have the valuation ring squared. The valuation ring, of course, is ZP now, ZP squared. And now what I want to do is I want to cut my ZP squared into smaller balls. So here in my picture, P is equal to three. And then, so this ball here is P ZP squared. And these are all the translates of them. So um, this here maybe is one plus p z p times minus one plus p z p and things like this. Okay. And now I can count how many of these smaller balls does my set meet. So maybe I mean okay, here my picture is maybe a bit sloppy, so my suppose this set goes like this here. Then I have these two balls here. Which meets my set. Okay, so this number I will call n1, which is 2. Then I do a further subdivision. Everything. So I have to, the, the, the one outside is not so important. And now I count um, how many balls, how many of the pink balls does my set meet? So these three here in this picture, these three, and these three, so it's a total of nine. And two equal nine. I mean, this is 
I mean, I mean, these numbers maybe make no real sense, but it, that's just to give you the idea. So let me write this down firmly. So n lambda, I'm using lambda because this is kind of a valuable parameter. I am using lambda always for value group things. It's supposed to be the um, number of set balls of Variated radius lambda flow balls, which are contained. Actually, I want to call it B prime for, for, for a reason which will be clear later, which are contained in Z P square such that B prime intersected Z is not empty. Okay, I can define this. And then, I mean, in some sense, you can also say maybe, maybe I like to have the, the thing in mind. I'm, I'm trying trying to draw a pixel version of my my curve, and so and I'm refining my balls always. I'm doing my making making the pixels smaller, and then counting how many pixels I have. Okay, and then one defines the Poincaré series. This is P, let me put PZ to say that it depends on this set Z here. So this is a formal series in a new variable, which I call T, and which is now sum over all lambda big O equal to zero, say. Um, so it's a formal series like this, and the coefficient of the zero, this series is just the n keys. Okay, and now, now sometimes one wants to look at this series, one wants to do this not, not in the whole evaluation ring squared, but maybe only on some small neighborhood of zero or some small neighborhood of some other point. So maybe instead I want to fix some ball B here and only look at the B prime inside this B. So B now in this evaluated ball. And then let me put, this is now the prime career series of Z on B or something like this. Okay. And um, now, I mean, okay, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe let me just vaguely tell you. So, Okay, now let me first make a connection to what I've done before. I claim that right symmetry or right of triviality is very useful if you want to de determine such a Poincare series. So the first claim is, so if alpha from B to B prime, uh, no, no, different B primes, B, B hat is a right symmetry, Then um, the Poincaré series of Z on B is actually the same as the Poincaré series of the image of Z on B hat. But but now for the uh, periodic valuation when you say right. Ah, yes. So now I'm right. I'm exactly. So, so I guess I should have. I mean, I use the I Okay. I, at last time I always told you to take piece of extra characters in zero. I uh, have yeah, a mixed characteristic now. I'm only doing very basic. That we can use the notion, but not the big theorem. Exactly. We can use the notion, but not the big theorem. Absolutely. And so, but I mean, a small theorem which we can certainly use is that a right symmetry is an isometry. Well, let's verify this here. A uh, right symmetry is certainly an isometry, and an isometry, I mean, a evaluative isometry. So let me just draw my alpha here. An isometry preserves evaluative balls. So if I have a evaluative ball here, alpha will send this ball maybe to another evaluative ball, but it will be a evaluative ball of the same radius. And so if this ball here contains a piece of x of z, then this will contain a piece of z. And so you just see 
I mean, if I just look at all the yellow balls here, and they might be somehow permuted by alpha, but certainly, I mean, I will have the same number of balls which contain a piece of X. So actually, here I don't even need the R, I just isometry is not. Let me remove the R because we an isometry preserves back array series. Okay. So this means now suppose my set um Z is let me draw a picture. It's one, say it's one trivial on can I draw it? Let's say suppose it's horizontally one trivial on this ball. So my set Z looks like this. So maybe this is a, okay. Now I can apply, so this is my Z. Um, I apply uh, rhizometry and make it actually translation invariant. Okay, I wanted to count the number of balls meeting the set here. This becomes a lot easier once it's translation invariant because then I can just, it's enough to count in one fiber and then multiply by a suitable number. So if I just look at one fiber, which I draw here again, so my set Z consists of only of these two points. So here I have three balls and one of them contains uh, points from my set Z. This one ball here will give me three balls here and these three balls of course give me the same number of balls. Here. And then here, cut it even smaller maybe, then I get two balls here and each of these balls here gives me nine balls from this picture here. And so I hope that you see from this formula, from this picture, that I hope that you will believe me that if I take, um, so let me write it here maybe, if Z is subset uh, some two dimensional ball, so QP squared in two dimension is one trivial on B. And um, denote by Z prime subset QP one fiber. And by fiber now I mean in a suitable direction, right? We call that when we were speaking about triviality, we said that, I mean, if I take my fibers in the right direction, then this fiber will be right in the right symmetry to this one and also to any other one. So I, I, I have to choose the right coordinates. Uh, I mean, suitable coordinates, but if I choose coordinates suitable, then I pick my Z prime here, so of course, suitable. Coordinates, and then, uh, then the number n lambda for the original z can be computed from the n lambda prime for this set by taking. I guess I just need to multiply with p to the lambda. Is this the right thing? Yeah, I mean, here this was the, the the yellow here, this was the n prime two is two, and this is n two equals two times nine. Okay, and this, oh, you would certainly believe this also works for higher things. So if I have d two, I mean, if I take ambient space n and I have d trivial, and then my fiber here lives in two pieces n minus d, and then I will have here p to the lambda times v, I think, if I did it properly. OK, and now this gives me an easy formula for the corresponding Poincare series. Let me write it as p z prime b prime. Now, this is the Poincare series. So b prime, this is my ball. No, this is my original ball b. And this projection here is b prime. So I want to express the original factor is P Z B of T. This will be. So let, let me put it into this formula. 
the n lambda is um, n lambda prime times p to the lambda d times lambda. So this here is, of course, equal to p to the d times t to the lambda. So this Poincaré theory, this is just equal to the Poincaré theory on the fiber, where I put in a factor p to the lambda here. So this is already should convince you that rise of triviality can be useful to understand Poincaré series. I mean, since almost all balls are rise trivial in some direction, this can, can be quite handy to determine Poincaré series. Okay, now let's see how to exploit this. Now the problem is, of course, now I want to apply all my big results, but the problem is that they don't hold in QP. I mean, or at least I did not prove them yet or whatever. I, mean, I have a guess that there's a variant which is, works in QP, but one needs to find what it is exactly. So I, I don't know how this works. So if, uh, how do you say, is that the same? If the, if the mountain doesn't come to the prophet, then the prophet is about the mountain or something like that? Okay, so if my big results don't come to the Poincaré series, then the Poincaré, I mean, don't come to QP, then the Poincaré series has to come to CT. So it's a total of zero. So uh, the Poincaré series also makes sense. In C double parentheses P. Now, this is something you shouldn't believe me. I mean, because here, if I've been counting balls, so now this here will be C double parentheses T, and this one will be T times C double parentheses T. So certainly somehow, I mean, the number of balls here, which was three, I mean, this, num I mean, this three here, this number of elements of the residue field, the residue field is C now, so this is no chance to give anything meaningful. I mean, all numbers will be just uncountable. I mean, cardinality of C, and so nothing interesting. However, um, this here, let me write to, to make it precise. Uh, Okay, anyway, at some point I will want to assume that Z is definable. So let's impose this here. If Z in CT and is definable, namely, what happens is I can abstractly introduce new numbers, which so, so, so I can uh, define a, a number in quotation marks, which is supposed to be number of elements of the residue field. So invent a new number which I write C in square brackets, which is supposed to mean, so you should think of it as meaning the number of elements of the residue. But that's not what it is in reality. Uh, so this is, I mean, what, where do these new numbers live in? So this is just, the Grothen degree of varieties over the complex numbers. So I can define a kind of counting. So, uh, so, um, can define counting taking values in this Croton decree. And I mean, that's really the theory of motivic integration. I mean, that's where this comes from. And so, or I mean, if you don't want to develop the theory of motivic integration, you can really check. So if I want to count these yellow balls in my CT, this means I have to take the image of my definable set under a residue map. And the image under the residue map will be 
some element of the growth of the of varieties. And I just take this as my number of elements. And so in this way, I obtain a Poincaré series. Um, P, Z, B again for, for my defined set Z and B evaluated form. And now this is a formal power series over this growth and decreasing of varieties. Okay. And the thing I did here turns out to still work. So here, I did tell, told you if I have one tree on the ball, then I, I mean, right symmetries preserve, preserve the, the counting. And then I can look at fibers. And then I get in this new world, I get a fiber where I said, I mean, this P here was number of elements of the residue field. So here I can put C to the D, which, if you want, is also in, the, in this growth big ring, it's also C to the D the class of, of C to the D. Okay, and now if, I mean, this was a very hand-made definition of this motivic Poincaré series, and now I can tell you the theorem, which is actually not too difficult to prove from all we have, is theorem um let's suppose x in c to the n is an algebraic set so defined as a zero set of polynomials i'm not sure whether i really need algebraic but be, let's be on the safe side And polynomial over C. And then I obtain a rise of certification F zero up to F D uh, sorry, up to F N partitioning C to the N. All right, this I can do using what I did so far. Now, if I take a point A in any of the strata, say in some SD, now take the infinitesimal neighborhood of A, let B be the set of um, how do I call it? Let's say little b such that the variation of b minus a is strictly positive. But now I do this in the field C double parenthesis T. Because I'm in I, I want to look at Pancare series. And Pancare series, they need a discrete value group. I mean, I cannot make this make sense out of this more generally. And then I can look at the Poincaré series of my set X in this field here. I should, I don't know how I should call it. I, I wasn't just calling this. So on this board B, this is equal to the Poincaré series of X prime B prime, where I'm uh, so sorry, I'm using this formula over there times C to the D for any. Um, so I'm not sure how to, how, how, I mean, for, for, for suitable, let me write for a suitable. Um, so N minus D dimensional fiber. 
um, x prime b prime. I, um, I hope one understands what I mean by this. It's very slightly. Okay. So, and so, um, yeah, let me say a few words about the proof of this. Because, I mean, there, there, there are some things which one sh is a bit afraid of, namely that suddenly I have this field, whereas all I've done before was, I, before I've always been working in, um, in C star, which is C double parenthesis T to the Q. Okay? Now, luckily, C double parenthesis T is a subfield of that one. And now one needs to prove that if I have a rhizometry within this field, then I also obtain a rhizometry within this field. This is not so trivial because not every rhizometry, I mean, the rhizometry are quite arbitrary. So not every rhizometry, if I have a rhizometry here, it will not send points over this field to points over this field. But you can modify it so that it does. And so, I mean, somehow, the existence of rhizometry behaves well with respect to restricting to subfields in this case. So passing to the subfield is not such a, I mean, it is work to prove it, but it works. There's another thing which maybe you probably maybe didn't notice, which should make you very afraid is, so <coughs> this count, this definition of counting, which I gave you, this now really uses that I have definable sets. And this is a kind of definable objects here. So certainly, if I would have two subsets of C to the N, which are in bijection, but not in definable bijection, then they will not be equal in this here. So I mean, the, 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 I mean, the complex line is in bijection to two copies of the complex line, just for cardinality reason. But they are different in this thing here. So if I want to say, if I want to prove that certain things have the same value here, I need a definable bijection somehow. Now here, I was telling you that here I have the same number of points as here because R has bijection, but not a definable bijection. So one really has the feeling that this Stupid non definable, as, I mean, that I don't assume definability here. This breaks everything if I want to apply it to, to model theory. However, one can nevertheless prove that if there exists a right symmetry, then it preserves these motivic numbers. And this again, I mean, this is some work, and it's again, I mean, it's not, this, it's not an easy argument. You really have to use. That you know the riser trees, and that you have only finitely many points in, in where you have this TR zero, and then you have finitely many points TR zero here. And you compare those and you piece things together in the end to get some definable pieces or something, and it works out. And so that's how one gets this. And so finally, one gets this application of the stratifications. And maybe if you quickly say that for witness certification, this claim is false. This claim would be false. If I take a witness certification, I cannot always compute the primary series by orthogonal finance. 